Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 151, Fergus's Day Off. Fergus, Fergus, wake up. Fergus, Fergus. Fergus opened his eyes and peered outside his shed. Directly in front of him was Molly. Come on, Fergus, she said. It's time to get up. You have work to do. Fergus groaned. I don't feel good, he said. I think I'm sick. Oh, come on, Fergus. I know you're not really sick. You're faking it. No, no, Molly, he said. I really don't feel good. I was up all night because my boiler was aching. <laughs> now you just sound like Henry, she said. But stop messing around, really. We have trains to pull. But Fergus wasn't having anything Molly said. He shut his eyes and went back into his shed. I don't feel good, he said. Molly realized that Fergus wasn't joking. I can't remember the last time that Fergus was sick, let alone missed a day of work. I don't want to bug him if he's actually ill. Oh well, it's just one day. I can cover his trains if necessary. Molly backed away to do her work. I'll be checking on you all day, Fergus, she said, just to make sure you're okay. And Molly puffed away down the track. A few seconds after she had left, Fergus peeked out of his shed. She bought it. <laughs> Fergus puffed cheerfully out of his shed onto the turntable. Molly's right, he said. I haven't missed a day of work in a long time. One day off won't really matter. Fergus made his way to the yard. Scruff was there, about getting ready to shunt some freight cars. Hey, Scruff, I'm taking a day off today. Want to come? Taking a day off? What? Molly just came by and said you were sick. What's going on? What's going on is that it's time you and I got to see the sights and sounds of Sodor. Let's go on an adventure. <laughs> yeah, right. I actually have work to do. No thanks. Now come on, Scruff. When was the last time you got to go out and see the world? I... I, I really don't know. It's been a long time, that's for sure. Exactly, said Fergus. You know what, Fergus? Maybe you're right. In fact, you are right. I will take a day off, but who will take care of these trucks? Now let's not think logistics here, Scruff. Soda will be fine, don't worry. Fergus bolted ahead and Scruff quickly turned around and followed him. The trucks didn't know what to say or do. They had never seen anything like this, ever. Meanwhile, Molly had made her way back to the sheds. She stopped by the turntable and peered inside. Fergus, are you there? How are you feeling? It was too dark inside the sheds for Molly to actually see something. She was about to venture closer when her driver spoke up. Let's go, Molly, he said. We can't leave our passengers here dawdling in the yard. You're right, she said. Fergus is probably sleeping. That's why he didn't respond. I shouldn't worry over things like this. Let's go. Molly pulled away and left the sheds behind. Little did she know what was really going on with Fergus. Scruff, when was the last time you were in back country? Never, shouted Scruff. This looks really fun. Well, <laughs> go ahead, laughed Fergus. Just don't go too fast, or else you'll fly off the track. Scruff raced down the hill as fast as he could. Whee, he said. This is fun. Scruff made his way to the end of back country where Boko was. He slammed on his brakes and nearly crashed into him. Whoa there, Scruff, said Boko. Why are you going so fast? Oh, no reason really, said Scruff. I'm just having fun. Fergus and I, I mean, um, um, I, I was just going really fast through the back country. Oh, all right. Just make sure you don't stay too far away from the yard, or else all the trains will get behind. Yes, Boko said Scruff. You're right. I'm going to head back now. Boko smiled and rolled away. Scruff now felt very guilty. Whoa, said Fergus. That was close, Scruff. Nice job covering for me. Fergus, I can't do this any longer. I need to go back. The island is probably in confusion and delay. No, it isn't. Boko seemed happy, didn't he? Everything's all right. Come on, we're almost done with our adventure anyway. Off to the docks. Meanwhile, Boko arrived at Ellsbridge Station. Molly was there, dropping off some passengers as well. Hello, Molly. Nice day, isn't it? I suppose so, she said. I'm concerned about Fergus, however. Fergus? Why? He's sick today. I hope he's all right. Well, that's interesting. I saw Scruff a moment ago, and he said something about Fergus as well. What did he say? 
He almost seemed to say that he was hanging out with Fergus, but I didn't see Fergus with Scruff. I wonder if something's going on and we don't know it. Come to think of it, said Molly, I didn't see Scruff in the yard earlier when I passed by there. Just a bunch of disorganized trucks. Molly and Boko realized what was going on. We have to get back to the sheds. Now, said Molly, and the two left their trains at the station. All right, Scruff, said Fergus. Come on, it's time to go home now. No, Fergus, said Scruff. This is fun. Spin me around again, Cranky. I think you should put Scruff down, Cranky. We need to get back to the sheds. Oh, all right, said Cranky. It's nice to see you guys. Come back again soon. Cranky put Scruff back down onto the track. The two quickly sped off back to the sheds. If Fergus and Scruff are messing around and not doing the work, I'm going to be very disappointed in them, said Boko. Me too, said Molly. I promised Fergus I'd take his train today, and if he instead decided to play around, I'll tell Sir Topham Hat right away. The two rounded the bend, and there was Fergus, sitting peacefully in his shed. Look, said Molly, Fergus is sleeping. Let's not wake him. I guess he's been there all day, said Boko. Never mind, Molly. I got a little ahead of myself. Sorry for the inconvenience. No worries, said Molly. Let's just get back to the station and finish our own trains. Once the two had left, Fergus opened his eyes. Scruff popped out of the shed next to him. Fergus, said Scruff, that was the best day ever. When can we do it again? Now let's not get ahead of ourselves, Scruff, said Fergus. All in due time. All in due time. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 152, Stepney and the Bluebell Branch Line. Of all the branch lines on the island of Sodor, there is one that stands out above the rest. After Stepney was saved from scrap by Rusty, Sir Topham Hatt rewarded him with his own branch line for his hard work. Even though Stepney doesn't have a lot of trains, that doesn't bother him at all. His passengers are loyal, and they think he is the best engine on Sodor. Today was a little different, however. A goods train needed to be taken from Knapford Station to Tidmouth Station, where Stepney's branch line began, and his driver volunteered Stepney for the job since they were going right by the station on their way to work. It was very early in the morning, and Gordon hadn't even arrived to pull the express. Both Stepney and his driver were very tired. Let's never do this again, said Stepney. It's too early for me to be out. Don't complain, Stepney, said his driver. Once this job is done, we won't have to deal with it again. All right, yawned Stepney. He was not very awake. The trucks realized this and planned to cause trouble for Stepney. Stepney's so tired he's about to fall asleep, they said. Let's play a trick on him while we can before he notices. The trucks agreed as Stepney pulled slowly out of the station. It's too early to pull trains, mumbled Stepney to himself. He was having a hard time even keeping his eyes open. The train continued down a long viaduct that ended with a curve near the airfield. Just before Stepney could start applying his brakes, the trucks began pushing harder. Go, 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 they yelled. Faster, faster, faster. Look out, Stepney, called his driver. There's a curve ahead. But Stepney was completely out of control. He was swaying side to side down the narrow line. Look out, called Stepney, but it was too late. The trucks pushed him down the hill and off the line right onto the airfield runway. Tiger Moth was coming in for a landing, and he had to quickly fly up as fast as he could to avoid the mess. When the smoke cleared, Stepney's driver and fireman realized it was a very bad crash. While the trucks laughed and giggled at their silliness, Stepney lay dazed and surprised. Oh dear, said the fireman. He looks like a tin can that somebody stepped on. I'll go call for help, said the driver, and he did. Soon enough, Harvey arrived with Rocky and the two set to work to clean up the mess. Sir Topham Hatt was on board, and he surveyed the damage. Stepney's going to have to go to the works for a very long time, sir, isn't he? asked Rocky. Yes, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'm afraid so. Stepney was soon on a freight car, and Paxton arrived to take him away. Sir, asked Stepney, will they be able to repair me at the works? I'm a very old engine, and I'm not sure if they have the correct parts for me. Don't worry, Stepney, said Sir Topham Hatt. I will make sure that you look good as new once they're all done. But even as Paxton pulled Stepney away, Sir Topham Hatt wasn't completely sure. I do hope they will be able to fix Stepney, he said to himself. And Sir Topham Hatt was right. Stepney was gone at the works for several months, but when he came back, he looked fantastic. A little different, perhaps, but he was still the same useful engine as he always was. The engines were surprised when they saw him. Wow, said Murdoch. Stepney, you look, you look fabulous. And, uh, a little different. 
Yeah, said Bill. It looks like you lost some weight. Don't say such things, said Arthur. And don't listen to Bill, Stepney. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Stepney laughed. Don't worry, he said. I know I look a little bit different, but that's because they didn't have all of the right parts for me at the works since I'm so old. But I think I look like a correct bluebell engine for once, don't you think? Yes, indeed, said Toby. They did an excellent job at the works. And yes, Bill, said Stepney. I did lose some weight. All of the engines chuckled. They were happy to have Stepney back on Sodor. Well, if you don't mind, said Stepney, I'm going to go have a run on my Bluebell branch line. I haven't been there in forever. The engines looked nervously at each other. They didn't want to tell Stepney what had happened. What's going on, said Stepney? Something's not right. Out with it. The engines still didn't say anything. Fine, said Stepney. If you won't tell me what's going on, I'll go see for myself. And Stepney puffed away very quickly. The engines looked around at each other. Stepney is not going to like what he finds, said Arthur quietly. When Stepney arrived at Tidmouth Station, he was shocked. It was completely deserted. What's going on? asked Stepney. Where are all of the passengers? Just then, Diesel rolled up, pulling a very dirty freight train. He was grumpy and cross. Move out of the way, he said in an oily voice, or I'll shove you off the line. How rude, muttered Stepney. I'm gone for a few months and they've replaced all of the nice engines with dirty diesels, it appears. Excuse you, said Diesel, but I've been on this railway longer than you have. Ah, said Stepney, so you must be Diesel. We've never officially met before, but I've heard a lot of bad things about you. At least you're out of the shed actually doing some work for a change. At least you finally decided to come back to your branch line, retorted Diesel. I'm tired of doing your work. Now that you're back, you can take this train. Goodbye. Wait, called Stepney. Where are all of the passengers? I'm supposed to take a train here very soon. Oh, said Diesel, grinning evilly. That's right, you've been gone. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but Sir Topham Hat shut down your branch line while you were gone. You don't have any passengers, Stepney. So sorry. Well, actually, not really. Have fun pulling this train. And Diesel rolled away. Stepney was very sad. My passengers are gone? Oh, this is terrible. Sir Topham Hat wouldn't have done this on purpose. I must go find him at once. And Stepney rushed away. He looked all over the island of Sodor trying to find Sir Topham Hat, but he couldn't. At last he stopped at Ellsbridge Station where Rosie was taking on passengers at the old slow coach. Stepney, said Rosie excitedly, you're back and you look different and tired. Is everything all right? No, said Stepney. I just came back from the works, and apparently my Bluebell branch line doesn't exist anymore. There aren't any passengers at the station. That's a big problem, said Rosie. Well, I, I wish I could help. Maybe you can, said Stepney. I'm looking for Sir Topham Hatt. Have you seen him? Come to think of it, said Rosie. He was here a few minutes ago, but then he had to leave because there was a big crash at Tidmouth Station, I think. Oh my, said Stepney. That's so strange. I just came from Tidmouth Station, and there wasn't a crash there when I left. You must have just missed it then, said Rosie. Just then, Stepney realized something. Oh no, he said. I left Diesel's train on the main line at Tidmouth Station. Somebody must have hit it. And before Rosie could say anything, Stepney was gone. He arrived at Tidmouth Station a few minutes later. Hank had come down the hill and it hit the back of Diesel's train. Everybody seemed to be okay, however. Hank, said Stepney, I'm so sorry for leaving this here. Is everybody okay? Everybody's fine, said Hank cheerfully. My cowcatcher did its job and just scooted the cars right off the line. Stepney, said Sir Topham Hat, did you cause this crash? I didn't mean to, sir, said Stepney. Diesel arrived and left this train here and said I had to take it. Sir Topham Hat sighed. Oh, Diesel, he said, always causing trouble. Well, I shall have a word with him about this. In the meantime, can you help with the cleanup, please? Sir, said Stepney, is it true that the Bluebell branch line is no more? Diesel said you gave all of my passengers away. Nonsense, said Sir Topham Hat. Don't believe a word Diesel says. I had to give your passengers to the other engines while you were away because nobody was running the Bluebell branch line, of course. Don't worry, Stepney. I will see where your passengers went and send them back to you at once. Sir, said Hank, if I may, but I believe I am carrying Stepney's passengers right now. Well, said Sir Topham Hat, huh? let's take a look and see. And Hank was right. The passengers got out and saw Stepney. They immediately ran over to him and made a circle around him. They were very happy to see him. Stepney, they said, you're back. You look so different, but so much better. We're so glad to see you. 
Thank you, said Stepney. I'm back and ready to pull trains again. Hank is great at pulling coaches, they said, but we prefer you, Stepney. Will you pull our train again? Absolutely, said Stepney. Come by the station tomorrow morning and it will be just like old times. And, as Stepney promised, the passengers were at the station the next morning, ready to go with Stepney. Stepney was very happy to have his passengers back. The Bluebell Branch Line lives on, shouted Stepney as he pulled out of the station happily. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 153, Around the Rail Yard in 64 Seconds. The narrow gauge railway was booming and bustling, and more and more passengers were flocking to see the beautiful sights in the mountains of Sodor. Because of this, the engines were stretched thin with work, and there was little time for rest. This was taking a toll on all of the engines, and repairs were needed. One morning, workmen arrived to repair a number of the narrow gauge engines. Duke's coupling to his tender was broken, Reneus' side rods were rusting badly, Mighty Mac needed new paint, Duncan's buffers needed to be fixed, and both Rusty and Smudger needed new wheels. The workmen sighed. These repairs are going to take a very long time, they said, several days at least, but we'll do our best. Duke grumbled to himself. Back in my day, he said, the controller sent you to the works to be repaired. Now it appears that the, the works comes to you. This is faster and easier than going to the works, said Reneus. I know we would all like to be pampered and go to crew for the week, but we can't let the passengers down. We owe so much to them. And every time I pull their train, all they do is grumble and shout at me, said Duncan crossly. Maybe it's because you rock and roll too much, laughed Ivo Hugh. Buffers don't become mangled and damaged by themselves. They do if you fall off the line too many times. That's enough, said Peter Sam. While all of you have a nice relaxing day in the shed, I actually have work to do. Hey, said Duncan, why don't you take the workman's engine with you? Nobody had really taken a close look at the engine that had brought the workman. He was small and brown and looked quite confident. Oh, don't mind me, said the engine. I'm just here to transport the workman back to crew. What's your name? asked Scarlowy. He was quite interested. My name's Bertram. A bigger engine discovered me a few years back by the old mines, but now I work the line from here to crew. I didn't even know there was a line to crew from here, said Sir Handel in surprise. No more going by flatbed on standard gauge line, it appears, exclaimed Smudger. All the more reason we should have gone to the works for repairs, grunted Duke. Bertram, said the workman, you don't need to stay here all day while we fix these engines. Go and explore, but be back by sunset so you can take us home. Bertram was quite excited not to have to sit around and wait. I want to see the station where the big engines are, he said. You can see Wellsworth Station from a distance if you take a specific line, said Sir Handel. Here, I'll show you. And the two set off along their way. Sometimes, said Sir Handel when they arrived, if the big engines are waiting on passengers, they just might talk to you. Have fun. Sir Handel left Bertram to look at the station by himself. Wow, it's so big, he said. They don't have anything like this where I work. Just then, a sparkly silver engine puffed up, pulling a very fancy coach. My, my, said Bertram. The standard gauge engines do look nice. The engine noticed Bertram off to the side. You must be a new engine, he said. I don't recognize you. I'm only here for a little bit, said Bertram shyly. Just helping with repairs, that's all. Well, he said, I'm Spencer, one of the grandest engines the island of Sodor has ever seen. I can tell, said Bertram. Pleased to meet you, he was awestruck at being so close to such a big and grand engine. What do your narrow gauge friends call you? asked Spencer. Well, my real name is Bertram, but I'm also known as the Old Warrior. I used to be quite the engine back in my heyday. Spencer chuckled. Oh my, he said. Well, if you were quite the engine back in your day, you could say that I am quite the engine nowadays. I've won multiple awards, best in show, engine of the year, most popular engine several times, by the way. You name it, I'm the fastest engine Sodor has ever seen. Bertram was amazed. Wow, he said, if only I could be like you someday. You can, said Spencer, you only need to do one thing. What's that? asked Bertram eagerly. You need to run the Sodor loop in a minute or less, said Spencer proudly. Wow, exclaimed Bertram. Well, I wish I could. But I can't because I'm not a standard gauge engine like you are. Tell you what, said Spencer, I'll make a deal with you. As long as you say good things about me in front of your friends, I'll let you do the narrow gauge version of the Sodor Loop. Really? said Bertram excitedly. When can I do it? 
Tomorrow morning, said Spencer, at eight o'clock you must zoom out of the shed and fly over here as fast as you can. If I judge that you've made it here in less than a minute, you'll be one of Sodor's grandest engines. Not as grand as me, of course, but still very grand indeed. Bertram smiled. I'll do it, he said. You won't be disappointed in me. And Bertram rushed away. Spencer laughed to himself. Silly, narrow-gauge engines, thinking that they're the same as me, the magnificent Spencer. Ha! Huh, this should be a good one. Later that night, Bertram sat with the other narrow-gauge engines. The workmen hadn't completed all of the repairs, so they needed to stay the night. Have any of you ever completed the Sodor loop before? asked Bertram quietly. What in the world is the Sodor loop? asked Reneas. I've never heard of it. An engine told me about it this morning. It sounds really fun, and I think I'm going to try it tomorrow. Well, whatever you do, said Peter Sam, just don't get into trouble. Otherwise, well, have fun. Bertram smiled. Little did the engines know that Spencer was pulling Bertram's chain, and that the Sodor loop really didn't exist. The next morning, Bertram awoke bright and early. As the other engines were beginning to doze as well, he realized it was almost eight o'clock. I can't be late, he said, otherwise Spencer won't let me be a grand engine like himself. And Bertram rushed away as fast as he could. Where are you going? asked Duke. The workmen are almost finished with us. But Bertram was gone. He raced over to Wellsworth Station. I mustn't be late, or I won't be grand like Spencer, he said. But Bertram took a wrong turn near the junction and found himself on a strange line. He could see Wellsworth Station in the distance, but he didn't know how to get there. Just then, Spencer pulled up. Oh, Bertram, he shouted. Where are you? You have, uh, ten seconds to get here. Bertram realized he was out of time. He raced down the line and accidentally flew right off the track into a field next to Spencer. Bertram groaned as he realized his big mistake. Spencer laughed and laughed. You silly tiny engine, he said. I'm sorry, Bertram, but it took you approximately uh, 64 seconds to go around the rail yard. You're not a splendid grand engine like myself. Better luck next time. And Spencer puffed away, laughing to himself. Bertram realized he had been tricked. The big engines are mean, he said to himself. Cheer up, said his driver. At least nobody else saw you crash. That engine is just looking for somebody to pick on. Still, said Bertram, I'm not a grand engine after all. Oh, you've always been a grand engine in my book, old warrior. Now let's get you cleaned up. While Bertram did feel better after what his driver had said to him, he was still wondering how he could get back at Spencer for being so cheeky to him. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 154, The Great Western Way. It was summertime on the island of Sodor, and between the raging heat and the complaining passengers, the little western branch line was kept very busy. Duck and Oliver were constantly pushing and pulling trains everywhere to keep up with the demand. Because of their busy work schedule, however, their tempers were as hot as the temperatures, and they quickly became cross with one another. One morning, Duck arrived at Tidmouth Station with his passengers. He needed to fill up on water, but there was a train blocking his line. Oh, Oliver, said Duck crossly. He left his train on the line here again. How many times is he going to do that? We don't have time to move the car, said his driver. These passengers can't be late to the station. We'll have to fill up somewhere else. If I run out of water, this is going to be Oliver's fault, said Duck, and he began to back away. A short while later, he rolled to a stop at the docks. His water tank had run dry. Told you, said Duck crossly. Now what are we going to do? Just then, the dockmaster walked up. Henry is coming through with the express right now. This is the only open line and we need to move you. Quick, said Duck. Get the passengers out of here. Don't worry me, Hardy, said Salty as he coupled to the coaches. I'll pull you to safety. But Salty wasn't strong enough to pull Duck and the heavy coach. Just take the coach then, said Duck quickly. Keep the passengers safe. Salty moved the train into a siding just in time. Henry rounded the bend, and there was Duck, right in his way. Look out, cried Henry, and he applied his brakes. He hit Duck very hard, which sent him spinning off the track and into a shallow portion of the harbor. Whoops, said Henry, that's what you get for being in the way of the express. Duck was more cross than hurt. In fact, Henry was just fine and left with the express a short while later. While he was glad that the passengers were safe, Duck was still cross at Oliver for getting him into the situation. Duck was lifted out of the harbor during high tide that evening and went back to Ellsbridge Station. Oliver was there, and he and Toad were telling jokes. There you are, Duck, said Oliver. I was wondering where you went. 
I was at the docks pretending to be a fish, said Duck crossly. You left your cars on the line again at Tidmouth and made me run out of water at the docks and cause a crash. Sorry, said Oliver. I didn't mean to. Just then, Sir Topham had arrived. He had urgent news. Tomorrow is the 4th of July, and I believe that the railway inspector is planning a surprise visit. However, I'm thinking he won't look like a regular inspector. He's going to be, uh, undercover. Why doesn't he get out of bed then? asked Oliver cheekily. Enough with the jokes, said Duck sternly. I already experienced one today. Just because you were lazy and forgot to fill up on water doesn't make it my fault, retorted Oliver. Enough! shouted Sir Topham Hatt. My goodness, let's worry about the railway inspector and then fight about petty things later, shall we? But sir, said Duck, there are going to be so many passengers here because of the holiday that it's going to be hard to pick him out from all of the people. Exactly. You two must be very watchful and try to pick him out from the crowd. If you spot him, make sure he gets on your train. Then, give him the best experience ever so we can get a favorable review. I will do my part, sir, said Duck. I sure hope Oliver doesn't mess up again here like he did today. Just because you've been on the railway longer doesn't mean you can tell me what to do, retorted Oliver. Silence, said Sir Topham Hatt. If you two can't say anything nice, don't say it at all. Duck and Oliver didn't speak another word. Very well. Please leave today's problems behind you and focus on tomorrow's events. If you do well, you can go watch the fireworks that evening. Sir Topham Hatt walked away and left the two engines alone. Duck and Oliver still didn't say a word, and they still hadn't talked to each other the next morning either. Things were growing uncomfortable. You two better be ready, said Nelson. I hear from Jack and Alfie that there are a ton of passengers at the docks. It's going to be a very busy day. Just then, Bertie arrived, outstreamed many, many passengers onto the bridge. Whoa, said Oliver. There's a lot of people here. Try and spot the railway inspector, said Duck quickly. Don't tell me what to do, said Oliver. I can handle things just fine. Suddenly, Duck spotted a man. That might be him, he said. He looks quite serious. At the same time, Oliver spotted a lady who was dressed up very nice. Sir Topham Hatt didn't say if the railway inspector was a man or a woman, so that could be her. However, the two didn't tell each other what they had just seen. The guard's whistle blew as the gentleman stepped into Duck's coach, and the lady hopped aboard Oliver's train. I've got the railway inspector, said Duck cheerfully. Here we go. No, I do, shouted Oliver, and he chased after him. Just then, Bulgy pulled up. I'm here to take the leftover passengers. A man stepped forward. He was the real railway inspector, and had been standing behind the crowd of people so Duck and Oliver couldn't see him. Well, if I can't get on a train, he said, I suppose I could take the bus. Oh, these are dreadful seats. Bulgy heard what he had said and reversed quickly. I'll give that man the worst bus ride of his life for saying that. And he raced away as fast as he could. Later that day, Duck arrived at Knapford Station. His passengers got out and the gentleman began walking toward him. Oh my, said Duck. He's going to congratulate me on giving him such an excellent train ride. But the man had a different idea. Excuse me, he said, but where might I apply to become a ticket collector? What, said Duck in shock. You're not the railway inspector. What? No, uh, of course not. Well, I've been a lot of things in the past, actually. A fisherman, signalman, a truck driver for a while, but the last time I took a drive, an engine chased me right off a cliff. Duck didn't listen to the rest. Oh dear, he said. If I don't have the railway inspector, then Oliver must have him. Oliver puffed in a few minutes later, but the railway inspector wasn't on board. Where did she go? asked Duck. She got off at the docks a few hours ago. She was just a regular passenger, not the railway inspector. So we've both lost the railway inspector, said Duck sadly, so Topham Hat will not be happy. Just then, Bulgy drove by and a man leaned his head out the window. Excuse me, Mr. Bus, but I am the railway inspector and I deserve better treatment than this. There he is, said Oliver. Wait here, said Duck. I'll go and try and stop Bulgy. Oliver didn't want to wait at the station, but he knew it had to be done. Duck chased Bulgy all over Sodor, but every time Duck would go near him, Bulgy would cut off from the road. He even took the passengers into the narrow gauge railway, but his extra driving caused him to run out of fuel right when he left the hills. The passengers were very upset. You miserable bus, they said. Now we're stranded, and on the 4th of July, too. We're going to miss the fireworks. Bulgy felt very silly. I'm sorry, he said, but the passengers didn't care especially the railway inspector. This is going on my report for sure, he said. I can see the headline already. Sodor bus kidnaps handsome railway inspector against his will. Ugh, this railway is getting a bad review for sure. 
Just then, Duck puffed down Gordon's Hill. He saw Bulgy right away, and the passengers waved him down. Please take us to the station, they said. We're tired and want to go home. I wish I could, said Duck, but I don't have a coach. But I do, said a voice. Oliver had come from the other direction with his coach from the station. Well done, Oliver, said Duck. Great thinking, and just in time, too. The railway inspector was not impressed. This is the worst railway ever, he said snootily. Mr. Inspector, said Duck, if I may. My friend Oliver and I had a falling out last night, and we didn't talk to each other this morning. Because of that, Bulgy accidentally took you instead of one of us. We're terribly sorry, sir, for the mix-up, that is. The railway inspector looked around. Well, he said, I'm still not impressed with what I've seen today, but it appears you two have solved your differences and put the railway before yourselves. You don't see dedication like that on every railway. Very well. Please tell your fat Sir Topham hat to you, sir, said Duck sternly. Yes, uh, well, yes. Tell your Sir Topham hat <laughs> that I will return in a few months to do another evaluation. In the meantime, fix this bus and don't let him pull passengers ever again. You would be better off as a chicken coo. And the railway inspector stepped aboard the train. Well done, Oliver, said Duck. You did it. No, said Oliver. We did it. Come on, let's head home to our little western. And the two set off to Ellsbridge Station. Happy Fourth of July, shouted Oliver happily as the fireworks exploded overhead. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 155, Big City Rumor. One evening at the sheds, the engines were telling Paxton about the time they went to the big city. He was very intrigued by the story and listened to it carefully. Even though my buffers were heavily damaged, Thomas was saying, I was fixed just in time and Sir Topham Hat let me go with the rest of the engines. Wow, said Paxton, talk about a close call. We had lots of fun at the big city, recalled James. Fun, said Duck. You thought that was fun? Sitting in that hot shed for hours on end while people took pictures of you and made you smile until your cheeks hurt? Ugh, I was very glad to come home. I'm going to ask Sir Topham Hat about it, said Paxton. That is, about going to the big city. I want to see what it's all about. All of the engines chuckled. Huh, replied Gordon. I doubt it. Sir Topham Hat is a very busy man, and the last thing he needs to hear is a rumor about you going to the big city. I'll just ask him the next time I see him, and if he says no, oh well, it's worth a shot. Good luck, said James cheekily. You'll need it. Wait and see, said Paxton cheerfully. You never know. And they were all soon asleep. The next morning, when the engines awoke, they were very surprised to find that Paxton was gone. Where did he go? asked Thomas. He doesn't have any early trains. He probably went to go pack his suitcase for the big city, laughed James. Oh, do be quiet, said Toby. Look, here comes Paxton right now. Paxton pulled up and stopped. Guess who's going to the big city? What? cried the engines. Sir Topham Hatt is letting you go, asked Gordon. I leave this afternoon, said Paxton. He turned to James. What do you have to say to that? James stumbled as he tried to find the words. Uh, uh, be beginner's luck, he mumbled quietly. Paxton laughed. I'll be back in a few days. In the meantime, I'm going to go say goodbye to a few other friends. See you all soon. The engines were quite surprised. I can't believe Sir Topham Hatt is actually letting him go to the big city, said Percy, and all alone, too. I guess we all know who Sir Topham Hatt's new favorite engine is, said James crossly. Oh, be quiet, said Thomas. You're just jealous that you can't go. I'm happy for Paxton, and what a cool story. Nearly scrapped on the other railway to visiting the big city. How cool is that? All of the engines, even James, had to agree that Paxton did deserve to go to the big city. Later that day, Paxton arrived at the docks to say goodbye to Cranky. Bill and Ben were there, and they had heard that Paxton was leaving. We'll miss you, said Bill. Bring a postcard back, please, said Ben. Don't worry, laughed Paxton. I'll only be gone for a few days. In the meantime, an engine from the big city is coming here to take my place while I'm gone. Please be nice to him, and no tricks. The twins smiled, and Paxton rolled away. The engine from the big city arrived the next morning, and Bill and Ben were the first ones to greet him. Hello, said Bill. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Sodor. Well, I don't need any introductions, said the visitor sternly. Leave me alone. Well, said Ben, we could give you a tour. We know a few secret places we could take you. Like what? asked the engine. Well, um, we, uh, we have this hill that, uh, that an engine got stuck on once. Yeah, yeah, said Bill. And, uh, one of our engines was afraid of the rain and got stuck in that tunnel right over there. 
I don't have time for engines like you, said the visitor. I'm here to do my work and leave once it's gone. And the engine wheezed loudly as he puffed away. How rude, remarked Bill. We were just trying to be nice. I don't like Paxton's replacement at all, said Ben. What's this about Paxton's replacement, asked Neville. Yeah, said Ben. Paxton's replacement is mean. Paxton got replaced. Oh dear, this is terrible. And Neville rushed away. I know, said Bill. I can't wait for Paxton to come back so this visitor can leave. Unfortunately, Neville misunderstood Bill and Ben and thought Paxton had actually been replaced for good. He told Donald right when he saw him. Paxton's been replaced. Oh dear, that's terrible, said Donald. He then told Douglas at Natford Station. Paxton's gone, asked Douglas. That's terrible. He was one of our hardest workers on the island. Hey, Daisy, did you hear that Paxton is gone? Sir Topham Hat got rid of him, apparently. What? cried Daisy. Oh, no. You know what? Norman needs to hear about this. Whiff, will you go tell him? Yes, said Whiff. This is an urgent matter, and Norman deserves to know. And when he finally found Norman, Whiff told him the news. He was very confused. Are you sure this is right? I'm positive, said Whiff. I saw the strange engine that replaced Paxton earlier today. He looks a little familiar, but I can't quite put my side rod on it. Well, I'm not going to let Sir Topham Hat get rid of one of my best friends, said Norman defiantly. I'm going to go do something about this, and Norman rushed away. When Whiff arrived later that day at the sheds to tell the other engines, there was confusion everywhere. Stanley had also arrived to tell the engines what had happened to Paxton. Apparently, said Stanley, he was sent away because he was using up too much oil. Mavis had arrived as well. I heard he kept on rearranging the trucks in the yard, so Sir Topham Hat sent him to be scrapped. You're all wrong, said Wilbert. Paxton's going to the works to get a wheel conversion. Somebody told me he wants to become a narrow gauge engine and work up in the hills. That's enough, shouted Thomas. Do you realize how crazy you all sound right now? Paxton being scrapped? Hogging all the oil? Becoming a narrow gauge engine? What is this? It's just a bunch of rumors flowing around, said Toby sadly, and apparently you all believe them. Paxton went to the big city because Sir Topham Hatt let him, said Thomas. Another engine came in return as an exchange. But in a few days, both Paxton and the new engine will be returning to their correct railways. Oh, said the engines in unison. That's right, said Sir Topham Hatt, who had just appeared. Enough with the gossip. Back to work, everybody. And the engines moved quickly away. Today's been a very interesting day, sir, said Duck. Everyone is very confused about what happened to Paxton, but I'm glad you made everything clear again. This is what a rumor does, said Sir Topham Hatt. It creates chaos. Not to mention confusion, said Gordon. And delay, added Henry. Sir Topham Hatt smiled. Yes, those as well. Now I know most of you wanted to go back to the big city as well, but please let Paxton enjoy his trip when he gets back. He's worked very hard lately, and I thought he deserved it. Yes, sir, said the engines, we will. Good, said Sir Topham Hatt. Now get a good night's rest. And he walked away. A few days later, Paxton returned and the engines greeted him warmly. He had enjoyed his trip, but he was happy to be back on Sodor with his friends. In the meantime, the visitor was preparing to leave for his station in the big city. He had not enjoyed his trip to Sodor at all and was quite cross about the situation. Duck and Gordon felt bad for him. We're sorry you had such a bad trip, said Duck. The island of Sodor is a very nice place to work on. Yes, indeed, said Gordon. Maybe you'll choose to visit us again soon. Huh, grumbled the visitor. Not until London becomes Euston again. And he puffed away. Gordon and Duck sat there quietly for a few moments. He looks oddly familiar, said Duck finally. I believe I've had a similar conversation with an engine before, said Gordon. But I can't remember with whom. Huh, me as well, murmured Duck. Oh well, I'm tired. Let's go back to the sheds. And the two puffed away, not realizing what had just occurred. Thomas the Tank Engine in France, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 156, Station Situation. James was in charge of helping out at the fire station near the docks. The summer heat made the beautiful green grass of Sodor prone to fire, and if there was one, James and the crew needed to be ready at a moment's notice. He knew the job had to be done, but James found it rather boring. I wish something exciting would happen one of these days, he said. I'm tired of just sitting here all day waiting to put out a fire that might never happen. Just then, Donald puffed up. James, he said, come quickly. There's something I need to show you. Quick, yelled James, there's a fire. Go, go, go. And the firemen zoomed away as fast as they could. 
Donald couldn't believe what had just happened. No, silly, he said. There's not a fire. I just wanted to show you something before you had to let everybody on the island know what was going on. Oh, sorry, Donald, said James. What's the matter? Follow me, he said, and the two puffed away. They traveled to the back country area and found a strange car sitting on the line. What is it? asked James. It's Scruff's garbage car, said Donald. Remember, he pulls it around from time to time. But what's it doing out here? asked James. That's what I don't understand. You'd think Scruff would make sure to keep track of all of his cars. It's a bit odd that there's just a random car on the line in the middle of back country. We should return it, said James. Come on, let's take it back to the yard. Donald buffered up to the car and pulled it away. When they arrived back at the yard, they were shocked to find a mess. There were trucks everywhere, and Scruff was right in the middle of it. What's happened here? asked Donald. James! Donald! said Scruff. Oh, am I glad to see you. Please move those tankers out of the way. They're blocking the line, and I can't get out of here. Donald moved the cars away. We found your garbage car on the line in the middle of backcountry, said James. Why did you leave it there, Scruff? Well, I don't know, he said. I haven't seen that truck in a couple of days. I didn't put it on the track, if that's what you're asking. Interesting, said James. Very interesting. How long have you been trapped here? asked Donald. A while, said Scruff. It could have been longer if you two hadn't come along. Somebody did this on purpose, said James, deep in thought. What? asked Donald. James, nobody would purposely trap Scruff in the yard like this. No, think about it, said James. We find Scruff's car on the line. We come back here to return it and find that Scruff is trapped. It's a sign. Are you feeling all right? asked Donald. It's probably just a coincidence, that's all. It's only a coincidence if it happens once, said Scruff. James might be onto something if you can find another sign. Come on, said James. Let's go to Tidmouth Station. Why? asked Donald. I have to pull a train soon. Look, said James, the milk tankers. Tidmouth milk tankers. There might be something else there. Let's go. James puffed away immediately. Donald and Scruff didn't know what to think. I've never seen James so determined before, said Scruff. I wonder if somebody put something in James's cold this morning, said Donald, and he followed after him. The two arrived at Tidmouth Station to find a messy surprise. Flower cars had been tipped over and they were covering the line. We can still get through, said Donald. Nothing's blocking the track. But, said James, an engine speeding around that bend and slamming on their brakes will find the track to be slippery because of the flower. And that bend right there is pretty sharp. Somebody's doing this on purpose. Are you saying someone is sabotaging the island of Sodor? Why would anybody want to do that? No engine has time to go get the wash down, let alone plot the demise of a railway. Still, said James, you can't say that this is coincidence again. Oh, you're right, said Donald. Something is amiss. Well, where do we go next? James the detective. James smiled. This flower has come from the flour mill. We might be able to find something at Toby's windmill. Hey, Kelly, let the station master know that the tracks are slippery right here. Tell him to warn the engines before they reach the station. I will, said Kelly, and James and Donald puffed away. Ah, just as I thought, said James. More clues. These cargo cars belong at the docks, not at the flour mill. Let's take them back and see if we can find anything else. James buffered up to the cargo cars and began pushing them, but he nearly ran over Fergus, who was exiting Ellsbridge Station. Whoa, watch out, exclaimed Fergus. No need to hit me off the track this early in the morning. That was a close call, said Donald. Whoever is putting these trains down probably intended you to hit an engine coming from Ellsbridge Station. Do you see what's happening here, asked James. These tricks are becoming more and more dangerous. Scruff trapped in the yard was harmless, but flour on the track and these cargo cars could cause some serious damage. We have to get to the docks before anything bad happens, said Donald, and the two rushed away. The docks was calm and peaceful when they arrived. Something's not right, said Donald. It's too quiet. James noticed two oil cars off to the side. Cranky, he asked. How long have these been here? Uh, not very long, said Cranky. Although, I can't remember which engine brought them here. Either way, they've about gotten in the way of a few trains today. Have there been any, uh... Close calls? asked Donald. Why, yes, said Cranky. A couple of engines probably would have crashed into them if I hadn't seen them coming and warned them to slow down. Bingo, said Donald. These oil tankers were an attempt to cause a crash, but luckily we got here before anything bad happened. Cranky, I'm afraid that nobody will be coming to pick these up. Mind if we do? Oh, yes, please, said Cranky. Get them out of here before something bad happens. 
James began moving the cars away. I'm going to head to the oil depot, said Donald. Why there? asked James. Oil cars, oil depot. Duh, laughed Donald. Do can play at this game, James. James laughed. Well done, Donald, he said. I'll see you there. But Donald was disappointed when he arrived. The oil depot was deserted. Where's the next clue? asked James. Maybe there is no next clue, said Donald. Maybe we reached the end of the game. But there has to be more, said James. No engine would put random rolling stock all over the island just for fun. There has to be more to the story. Just then, Billy pulled up. He was pulling some china clay cars. Excuse me, he said, but these need to go right here. Donald and James looked at each other. Why? asked Donald. Oh, you know, said Billy. Sir, Topham Hat's orders, that's all. James smiled. Have you been doing these types of odd jobs from Sir Topham Hat all day, Billy? Billy looked at the ground. Uh, no. Aha, said James. We found our culprit at last. Well, don't blame me, said Billy nervously. I was just doing what I was told to do. Who's telling you to do this then? asked James. Billy didn't say anything at first. I'm not sure, he said. But how about I show you? Donald and James were confused. All right, they said. Soon the three pulled up to a crossing at the narrow gauge railway. Bertram and Peter Sam were sitting there. Ah, Billy, said Peter Sam, you've brought some friends. Have you two been doing this all day? asked James. Doing what? asked Bertram. Putting trucks and cars all over the island, attempting to cause a huge crash. Well, no, absolutely not, said Bertram. We would never do anything like that. Billy said he was bored, and I started to make up random things he could do. But in my defense, said Billy, I've never seen this strange engine before. James and Donald glared at Billy. You're taking orders from a narrow-gauge engine that just wanted to have some fun? Well, sorry, said Billy. I'll go clean up the mess. And he puffed away. Donald couldn't help but laugh. All this time, James and I thought a serious situation was going on. But it just turns out it was just Billy being silly. James chuckled. If Billy is that gullible, we could have some real fun with him later. James stopped as he saw the fire trucks pull up. Oh dear, said James. I was supposed to help the fire department today. And I forgot to pull my train, exclaimed Donald. Bertram and Peter Sam looked at each other and laughed. Yeah, Bertram said. Billy sure is the silly one out of this group. And the engines burst out into hearty laughter. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 157. Duncan in the dumps. While all of the narrow gauge engines were thrilled to have Bertram working alongside them, Duncan was still particularly cross about the situation. He didn't understand the fascination with the works engine, and it grew worse every day. What's so interesting about him? He grumbled to himself one evening. There's nothing special about him. Who cares if he brought some magical workmen that repaired all of us engines? That doesn't make him a hero, does it? Still, the engines were fascinated with him. He tells the craziest stories, said Scarlowy one night, and they're so entertaining. They give my stories a run for their money, laughed Ivo Hugh. He's so kind, said Rusty. He offered to take my train just the other day. And he has quite a knack for annoying the standard gauge engines, joked Peter Sam. Do you think Sir Topham Hat will let him stay permanently, asked Sir Handel. The workmen left a long time ago, said Fearless Freddy, and if Sir Topham Hat didn't want him to stay, I think he would have sent him back with them. Regardless if he stays or not, said Duke, Bertram will always be a part of this railway. Oh, give me a break, said Duncan, and he puffed away. He met up with Thumper a few days later. Duncan was still seething. You don't look too happy, said Thumper. Mind if I ask what's wrong? It's that new engine, Bertram, he said indignantly. All of the other engines do is talk about how wonderful he is. I don't see what all the fuss is about. You're right, said Thumper. Reneas and Ivo Hugh were here a few weeks ago, and they wouldn't stop talking about him. Bertram's made quite an impression on your railway. If only I could get the engines to stop talking about him, murmured Duncan. Then at least I could deal with it, let alone having to listen to his epic tales before we go to sleep at night. Thumper thought long and hard before speaking. Remember when Smudger came to the railway and all the engines paid a lot of attention to him? It's like that, Duncan. Bertram's the new engine in town, and everybody wants to talk about him. Plus, he's a nice tank engine in general. How can you dislike him so much? Gah, grunted Duncan. You're no help. And he puffed away. Later that night, Duncan was thinking about it again. The engines will probably stop talking about Bertram if a new engine arrives. Still, they would probably then talk about the new engine for hours on end, but anything's better than story time with Bold Warrior. 
Duncan decided it was a good idea and set to work. The next day he saw Sir Topham Hatt at the wharf, and he decided to speak to him about it. Sir, said Duncan, isn't it about time that the Narrowgate Railway received a true permanent addition to our line? Why, you've just received Bertram, said Sir Topham Hatt. He handles all of the extra work, doesn't he? Duncan didn't know what to say. Eh, I suppose. What? asked Sir Topham Hatt. Is Bertram not doing his work? Who knows, said Duncan, looking away. I'm not one to gossip, but let's just say that the railway ran smoother before his arrival. Duncan puffed away before Sir Topham Hatt could respond. If Duncan is right, he said, maybe I've made a big mistake after all. In the end, Duncan's plan did not work. He was cross for sure and vowed to make sure Bertram wouldn't get away so easily. Finally, his chance came. A few days later, Bertram was bringing some slate cars to the incline. Duncan had seen this coming, and so he left the breakdown train on the line at the entrance. The slate cars realized they had a chance, and they began to push Bertram faster. Go, go, on, on, on! I can't stop in time, yelled Bertram, and he purposefully missed the entrance. Bother, grumbled Duncan. That was my only chance. Look out, cried Bertram as he slammed on his brakes. Amazingly, Bertram managed to stop himself before he hit the back of Duke's shed. Unbelievable, shouted Fearless Freddy. Well done. That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, said Scarlowy. Duncan grew crosser still. Pa, he said, instead of making Bertram look silly, I've done the exact opposite, and now he's more appreciated than ever before. But Duncan wouldn't give up so quickly. A few days later, he asked Airy to place some empty cars on the line following the exit of Boulder Mountain. When Bertram comes down the hill, said Duncan, he won't have time to stop and he'll crash into those cars and cause a huge mess. Just then, Reneas came over the hill with some baggage cars. Excuse me, Duncan, he said. I need to get through here. Ugh, fine, said Duncan, and he backed onto the main line. Look out, cried Bertram as he reached the top of the mountain hill. I won't have time to stop. Duncan realized the danger and rushed forward. In fact, he was so scared Bertram would come flying down the hill and into the back of him that he ran straight through Boulder Mountain and into his own trap. Duncan went flying through the air and into the signal at the bottom of the incline. Oh, come on, said Duncan crossly. Not again. Bertram pulled up. That doesn't look good, Duncan, he said. Whoever put those cars on your line was very careless. Although down, but not out, Duncan still wouldn't give up. Bruised, battered, but not beside himself yet, Duncan began working on his next plan. I cannot have gone through all this just to give up, he said. I'll think of something else. Duncan's chance came sooner than expected. Rusty wasn't feeling good one afternoon, and an engine had to take his train. Why don't you do it, Duncan? asked Ivo Hugh. No thanks, hissed Duncan. The passengers and I don't get along very well. Passengers? exclaimed Bertram. I'll take it then. Great, said Ivo Hugh. They love you, Bertram, so you can take it for sure. As soon as Bertram left, however, a giant storm started to roll in. We should probably go send somebody out to find Bertram, said Duke. He's not very experienced about all of the lines yet, and Ada, Jane, and Mabel don't have roofs. The passengers will be cross if it starts to rain. Duncan, will you go find him? Why not, said Duncan, but inside he was very cross. Rain falling on the passenger's head is just what Bertram needs to bring him down the sides, he grumbled. A short while later, he found Bertram stuck at the top of the mountain hill. Not this again, Duncan sighed. Don't worry, Bertram, he yelled. I'll come save you. Bertram had actually stopped intentionally because the passengers were surrounded by rock, so the rain didn't hit them and the wind wasn't as annoying. As Duncan trudged up the hill, the wind became stronger and the rain began to sting. Well, this is annoying, he muttered. All this for a lousy engine and some lousier passengers. Just as he reached the top, however, a giant gust of wind blew up and rocked Duncan side to side. This can't be good, he said, and the wind toppled Duncan right off the track and over the edge. He landed in a ravine and was covered in mud, leaves, and sticks. The passengers were relieved to find out that Duncan was okay, but the cleanup process took a long time, and finally Madge had to come and tow Duncan away. He felt very silly indeed and was waiting to be taken to the works when Bertram arrived. I'm sorry about your accident, said Bertram. If I hadn't stopped up top, none of this would have happened. Trust me, said Duncan. I'm pretty sure I would have found a way to mess things up regardless of where you stopped on the track. I've been a very silly engine lately. Just then, workmen hopped out of the caboose. What are they here for? asked Duncan. Once I dropped the passengers off, I went straight to the works and brought these men back. I know how lonely it can be at the works with no one to talk to, so I thought it would be nice to be repaired next to your friends. 
Duncan was quite shocked. He couldn't believe how nice Bertram was treating him. Thank you, he managed to say, but Bertram, there is something I have to tell you. I've had it out for you the past couple of weeks, and I've realized I've been a very silly engine. Would you be uh, willing to forgive me for my actions? Oh, of course, said Bertram. No worries at all. Just then, Max and Monty came racing around the corner and crashed right into Madge, sending Duncan off the flatbed and into the dirt. You two get back here, yelled Madge, but it was no use. Duncan couldn't help but laugh. I probably deserve this, he chuckled. Even the best workman in the world can't fix a bruised ego. And with that, Bertram and Duncan reconciled and became one of the best friends the island of Sodor has ever seen. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 158, Just Duck's Luck. Duck is a hard-working engine and is determined to make sure everything runs like clockwork. Unfortunately, he can overwork himself sometimes, and this causes him to break down. Not only does this annoy Duck, but Sir Topham Hatt does not like this as well. Duck, he said, you must learn to be a really useful engine without me having to send you to the works every six months for repairs. Your parts are just as valuable as your passengers, and you must treat them both with respect. Otherwise, I will have to give you less work so that you stop breaking down. Duck was sad at the situation. I only want to do things the great western way, he said quietly. But Sir Topham Hatt is right. Maybe I am overworking myself. When he returned from the works, Duck felt much better. Word had gotten out what Sir Topham had had said to Duck, and the engines thought it was quite funny. He's the only engine in Sodor's history that's been yelled at for working too hard, laughed Arthur. If Sir Topham Hatt told me to stop working hard, said Wilbur, I'd never move from the sheds at all. What a life! There are two ways of doing things, mimicked Henry. The Great Western Way, or the way that makes you break down faster than Derek with his teething troubles. Your comments are greatly appreciated, said Duck smoothly, but I prefer to actually earn my keep on this railway, rather than participate in Arthur's excellent discussion group here at the Brown Turntable. Goodbye. Not only was Duck cross that everyone was making fun of him, but he didn't understand why. Fancy that, he muttered to himself. The engines think it's funny that I break down, even if I do so while I'm working hard. Very few engines have the work ethic that you do, said Boko as he rolled in. Don't let their words bother you, and stick to what you're good at. Soon, they'll see you as an inspiration, and they'll try to copy you instead. Duck sighed. That will be the day, he moaned. For now, I'm stuck shunting in the yard because Sir Topham Hatt doesn't want me to do anything strenuous. This is the life for sure. Boko chuckled. You're a lucky duck, you know. There are a lot of engines who would rather be here than pulling heavy freight trains like myself. You'll see in no time. Sir Topham Hatt will put you back into full-time service. Savor the moment, duck. You never know when it might come to an end. While Duck was happy that Boko was giving him wise advice, he couldn't help but feel very helpless. The next day, he arrived at Ellsbridge Station to check on the Little Western. Stanley was there, ready to pull Duck's usual train. Be nice to the car, said Duck. They may be troublesome at times, but they're not awful. Ugh, we'll see about that, said Stanley. He bumped them hard. Let's go. Move it or lose it, Fred. You must really miss not being able to work, said Oliver. I can tell you for sure that the branch line ran a lot smoother while you were here. Stanley's a great help and all, but it's not the same, that's for sure. Seeing the little western and Oliver made Duck even sadder. The next weeks dragged on, and Duck was still unhappy. He was tired of the yard and wanted to go out and see what else was going on. Even Diesel has more work to do than me, he said unhappily. One morning his chance came. The yardmaster walked up to Duck and told him some urgent news. Stanley forgot that brake van for this train this morning. Would you be so kind to take it for him? Yes, sir, said Duck quickly. Before the yardmaster realized what was going on, Duck was down and away with the car. At last, he said to himself, I'm free to see the island. Oh, it's been a long time. When Duck arrived at Ellsbridge Station, however, he was surprised to find that Stanley wasn't there. Did Stanley leave with my train already? He asked Oliver. Yeah, said Oliver. He said right before he left that he felt like he was forgetting something, but he couldn't think of what it was. Well, I found it, said Duck. He'll soon remember when he asked the conductor to help him stop, and the conductor's not there. I need to go give this to him. Let me do it, said Oliver. You're not supposed to overwork yourself, remember? I guess you're right, mumbled Duck sadly. Whoa, Oliver, look at Jeremy over there. Wait, where? asked Oliver. Duck, I don't see anything at all. 
but before Oliver realized what had happened, Doc had quickly darted away down the line. I'm not going to let Oliver take my job if it's the last thing I do, he said defiantly. Duck ran his usual course around the island but still couldn't catch up to Stanley. He was quite out of breath when they stopped at Wellsworth Station to rest. Sweat poured down his face. You look ill, said his driver. Are you sure you're all right? Never better, gasped Duck. All these weeks in the yard shunting cars have made me weak. Ugh, I'm used to sprints, pushing trucks back and forth quickly. Now I don't have any endurance. You should probably stop, said his driver. Stanley's an experienced engine. I'm sure he'll be fine without a brake van. Duck weesh steamed loudly. I've come this far, he said. I'm not going to give it up now. Hop aboard, driver, or get left behind. And Duck pulled out of the station again. But Duck's driver was right. He became very tired, and his thinking was impaired. When the signalman switched the points to make Duck go on a different line than usual, he didn't think twice about it. He realized his mistake when he arrived at the sheds. The engines looked curiously at him. This isn't right, he muttered crossly. Now I've gone the wrong way and lost time on Stanley. Duck only became more turned around as the day grew on. He ended up at the docks by mistake and couldn't get through because of some overturned fishing cars. Ugh, the smell of fish is a bad one, he groaned. We'll have to find a different way. Are you sure you want to keep going, asked his driver. It's nearly evening. I'm sure Stanley has finished pulling the train anyways. Must. Keep. Going grunted Duck, and he puffed away, but things didn't get any better. While attempting to cross the transfer table, there was a loud clang, and it came to a screeching halt. Don't tell me it's broken, mumbled Duck wearily. I believe it is, said the driver, and about time, too. You need to rest. But Duck wouldn't have any of it. He backed up slowly to gain speed, and then rushed forward and somehow landed on the track in front of him. I can rest when I'm scrapped one day, said Duck, and he continued on. He was so disoriented and confused that he passed Stanley at Knapford Station and didn't even realize it. There's my brake van, exclaimed Stanley cheerfully. I've been looking for that everywhere. Where's Duck going? asked Harvey. He doesn't look good at all. At last, Duck finally ran out of coal in the backcountry valley. He was cold, tired, and his parts were quivering from the day's work. His driver and fireman inspected him as the sun began to set. Not only are you out of coal, said his driver, your brand new side rods are wearing down, there's a crack in your funnel, and your boiler needs a fresh cleaning, and that means that I'll have to go to the works again, finished Duck. This is terrible. Sir Topham Hat gives me a job to prevent me from going to the works, and I still find a way to mess that up. Fortunately, Percy found Duck on the line before night fell and brought him back to the sheds where Sir Topham Hat was waiting. Goodness me, said Sir Topham Hat. Duck, what on earth were you doing all day? Just performing duties in the yard, sir, said Duck wearily. An engine's gotta do what an engine's gotta do. Gordon couldn't help but chuckle. Your luck has finally run out, Duck, he said. Sir Topham Hat didn't know what to say. It appears no matter what job I give you, you're going to find a way to break down somehow. Quite a talent you have there, Duck. Very well. It appears that even against my best wishes, I am forced to... Sir, said Toby quietly, but I think Duck is asleep. And Toby was right. Duck was so exhausted from the day's events, he couldn't keep his eyes open any longer. The engines smiled at each other. Now there's a really useful engine, said Thomas. Of course, Duck was once again sent to the works and fixed. He was gone for a while, and the engines missed his company terribly. Because of this, they worked harder than ever before, and the island of Sodor continued to be one of the most productive railways in the world. At last, Duck finally returned, and Sir Topham Hatt was the first to greet him. Although it keeps costing me a lot of money, he said, I can't be mad at an engine who puts his railway before himself. Welcome home, great western engine. Three cheers for Duck, shouted Edward. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Duck was so caught up in the moment that he accidentally rolled forward and right off the track. Duck, the great western engine. You're an inspiration to us all, laughed Gordon. I guess you could say it's just Duck's luck, chuckled Oliver. And all of the engines, even Duck himself, had to agree. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 159. Hank and the Hat Street Crossing One morning, Patrick and Kelly were waiting at the crossing just outside of Ellsbridge Station. They weren't talking at all when Hank rolled up. What's going on here? asked Hank. Why are y'all stopped at the crossing? Shh, said Patrick. Listen. Hank sat silent for several seconds. He didn't hear anything. What's going on here? 
Be quiet, said Kelly. I think Patrick is on to something. Hank remained quiet once again. He was beginning to grow impatient. What exactly are we listening for? He asked. Wait, there it is, said Patrick. And... Nope, nope, that wasn't it. This is ridiculous, said Hank. I need to get through. Wait, said Patrick. You can't go just yet. Wait a few more seconds. Exasperated, Hank did as he was told. Just then, the crossing gate switched and the line was clear. I'm going now, said Hank. Have fun with whatever you two are doing. Wait, said Kelly. You have to stay here just a little while longer. What now, said Hank loudly. You don't know what this is about, asked Patrick. I am surprised. So am I, said Hank. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Please, let me through. Almost, said Patrick. Whenever you go across the Hat Street crossing, you must count to five troublesome trucks before crossing. Every engine on Sodor knows that. Like this, said Kelly. One troublesome truck, two troublesome truck, three troublesome truck. Oh, this is ridiculous, said Hank finally, and he rushed through the crossing and was gone. Oh my, said Patrick. Hank didn't follow the Hat Street crossing rules. This is going to be very bad. What's going to happen? asked Kelly. I'm not quite sure. It's been a long time since an engine has disobeyed the rules of the Hat Street Crossing. My best guess would be that Hank is going to have a lot of bad luck. Oh dear, said Kelly. Hank is going to regret this. Presently, however, Hank wasn't regretting anything. Those silly road vehicles, he muttered as he puffed into Ellsbridge Station. Wasting my time. That's what I call it. What's the matter with you? asked Murdoch. You don't seem too happy. I'm not, said Hank. Patrick and Kelly were over by the Hat Street crossing and were trying to convince me that something bad was going to happen if I didn't stop for a certain number of, uh, troublesome trucks, whatever that means. I'm tired of their silly games. You know I don't take nicely to spooky things. I do, said Murdoch. You had quite a fit during Halloween a few years ago, when the engines tried to trick you, remember? Silly nonsense. That's what I call it. Those two could be much more productive if they would actually stop wasting my time and do some work for a change. Cheer up, said Murdoch. At least you know there's not a curse on the Hat Street Crossing. I mean, it's named after Sir Topham Hat himself. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly, said Hank. Thanks, Murdoch. I need to go finish my work. A few days later, Hank was at the washdown to get a nice clean before pulling his train. Patrick and Kelly were there, and they looked at him curiously. What are you two doing here? asked Hank. Don't you have any work to do at all? I'm surprised to still see that you're in one piece, said Patrick. Most engines don't survive the days following a botched crossing. Are you still on this? asked Hank. This is more annoying than it is flat out ridiculous. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. That's not what happened to a particular engine I knew, said Kelly sadly. What are you mumbling about now? asked Hank impatiently. It was many years ago, said Kelly, looking far away into the past. I was working on a railway where... Oh, save it, said Hank. You're not going to trick me into thinking that there is something wrong with going across a piece of track. Goodbye. Hank puffed away. Patrick sighed. I sure hope he realizes his mistake before it's too late, he said sadly. I've had enough of this nonsense, said Hank finally. It's pure gibberish, and I refuse to believe any second of it. He paused at the lighthouse bridge. Look at it. It's just an ordinary crossing. Nothing's wrong with it. Look, even Trevor is fine not knowing the so-called truth behind the, the Hat Street crossing. Before Hank realized it, however, the gate suddenly shut on Trevor as he was on the track. Uh, this is strange, he muttered. Can, uh, can somebody please fix this? At the same time, the drawbridge began to rise slowly, making Hank fly down the incline and almost crash into Trevor. Hank stopped just in time. Oh, hi, Hank, said Trevor. A nice day, isn't it? A peculiar one, that's for sure, said Hank nervously. Never mind me. Go ahead. The gates were open for Trevor, and he made his way through the crossing. That was a close call, said Hank. I nearly got into an accident right there. He arrived at Ellsbridge Station a few moments later. Murdoch was there again, getting ready to pull Hank's train. There you are, said Murdoch. I was wondering where you went. Well, if you're here, then that means that I don't have to pull this train anymore. Thanks, said Hank. He was still out of breath. Are you all right? asked Murdoch. You look spooked. I am. Just a little, admitted Hank, and he told Murdoch what had happened. 
Seems like a pure coincidence to me, he said finally, but I wasn't the one who was there. Oh well, Hank, don't let it bother you. Here, take my train today. It's just empty freight cars. They won't be much trouble at all. Thanks, said Hank, and Murdoch puffed away. I can handle these troublesome trucks. There's not that many here anyway. Let me count them. One troublesome truck, two troublesome truck, three trouble... Oh, there it is again. Ugh, Patrick, Kelly. All right, I've had it. Let's go, you troublesome, uh... Uh, troublesome freight cars. Hank was in no mood to play games. He pulled the trucks all over the island and was on his way back to Ellsbridge Station at the end of the day when he stopped at the suspension bridge suddenly. Do you hear that? He asked his driver. Hear what? It's just the wind, nothing else. That's what happens when you stop on a bridge, Hank. No, something, something different, said Hank. His driver laughed. Now you just sound like Patrick and Kelly the other day. Just then there was a clang of metal and the suspension bridge collapsed, sending the freight cars downwards. Ah! screamed Hank. It's happening! It's happening! Patrick and Kelly will ride! And he raced down the hill so fast that his driver and fireman were both thrown from the cab. Come back, Hank! they yelled, but he was gone. Hank was so spooked that he raced through Ellsbridge Station and down the line. He nearly flew off the track at a bend because his driver and fireman were to board to control him. Look out, cried Hank as he climbed over the bridge. Then it happened. Hank's front wheels left the track at the bend and he continued on through a field of grass. Look out, cried Bertie. Engine coming through. Oh no, said Hank. There was the Hat Street crossing right in front of him. Hank shut his eyes as he hit the ramp, flew through the air, and became entangled in the suspension bridge cables. Hank couldn't believe what had just happened. Patrick and Kelly had been watching from a distance, and they didn't look surprised. That, said Patrick, is what happens when you don't obey certain superstitions. Do you think Hank will listen to us now? asked Kelly. Probably not, said Patrick. Those engines don't listen much anyway. Hank was so confused and bewildered by what had just occurred that he didn't know what to say. It was several hours before he was safely lowered from the bridge, and Sir Topham Hatt came to inspect the damage. I'm glad you're okay, Hank, he said. That was a very nasty accident. You'll have to go to the works for extensive repairs. Yes, sir, said Hank. I I'm sorry, sir. As Sir Topham Hatt began to walk away, however, Hank spoke up. Sir, asked Hank, this may sound a little silly, but... Is there a curse on your crossing over there? Strange things have been happening to me lately, not counting this airborne accident right here. Sir Topham Hatt paused for a moment. No, of course not, he finally said. Oh, good, said Hank as he sighed with relief, because I thought all of this was because of some silly little... Actually, said Sir Topham Hatt, an engine disobeyed the famous troublesome truck rule several years ago and ended up being scrapped because of it. Hank stared at Sir Topham Hatt. His face was pale and white. But that was a long, long time ago, said Sir Topham Hatt, and he walked away. Oh, I don't feel so good, said Hank as Derek pulled him away. Sir Topham Hatt walked over to Patrick and Kelly. Now that Hank's leaving, he said, can we please tell him that there is no curse so that I can get back to real railway problems? Patrick and Kelly laughed. Yes, sir, they said. We'll tell Hank once he gets back from the works right away, sir. And thanks for helping us out with our little game. But as Sir Topham Hatt walked away, Patrick and Kelly looked at each other. Both of them somehow knew that the fun was only beginning. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 160, Spencer Goes Too Far. One morning, the engines were at Knapford Station when Edward rushed in with some urgent information. Did you all hear the news? He asked quickly. What news? Asked James. The Duke and Duchess are leaving the island of Sodor. What? Cried the engines. I can't believe it, said Percy. The Duke and Duchess have been here on the island for a very long time. What is making them leave? Apparently, said Edward, they want to travel the world for a little while, so they're packing up all their things right now. Oh, said Toby, so you're saying that they'll be back eventually? Possibly, said Edward. I don't have a lot of information right now, but that's just what Sir Topham Hatt told me really quickly this morning. Well, said James, this begs an interesting question. If the Duke and Duchess are leaving, what's going to happen to Spencer? He's their engine, remember? Ooh, said Percy, maybe Spencer will travel the world with them. Please, no, said Toby. He come back from the trip and bragged to all of us about it. We don't need more of that on our railway. Edward smiled. I think Sir Topham Hatt is trying to decide whether to keep him or not. 
Let's hope Sir Topham Pat makes the right decision, said James, and sends that engine packing. Later that day, Edward arrived at the docks where the Duke and Duchess were preparing to set sail. The Duchess was sniffling and trying not to cry. I'm going to miss you, Topham, she said sadly. We'll be back in no time. Sir Topham Hatt, said the Duke. It's been a pleasure to be a part of your excellent railway. Maybe we'll even set up a museum with all of the artifacts we collect on our trip. What a wonderful idea, said Sir Topham Hatt. Please send a telegram to let me know how everything goes. Goodbye. The Duke and Duchess climbed aboard and the ship soon departed. Sir Topham Hatt turned his attention to the engines gathered. Don't worry, he said happily. The Duke and Duchess will return soon enough. In the meantime, I'm sure you all have work to do, so I suggest you go and finish it. All of the engines puffed away except for Spencer. He hadn't said a word the entire time. Are you all right, Spencer? asked Sir Topham Hatt. No, I'm not, he said crossly. The Duke and Duchess go on a vacation and leave me here on this filthy island. What great owners they are. Huh. Sir Topham Hatt ignored the rude remark. Actually, they're not your owners anymore. Spencer suddenly became very excited. Really? Nobody owns me anymore? Hooray! This is the most glorious day ever! Actually, Spencer, I am your new owner. Spencer's enthusiasm disappeared. What? he shouted. I'm still under your command? You've always been under my command, said Sir Topham Hatt. Remember, I am, after all, the fat controller. But Spencer had had it. I will no longer be told what to do. I am a special, proud engine, and I deserve better treatment than this. He puffed away at once. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. This isn't going to be fun, he muttered to himself. For the next few days, Spencer did nothing but sit in the shed. The engines completely ignored him. They weren't very happy that Spencer was still on the railway. Nobody here appreciates me, said Spencer crossly. I work very hard and, well, maybe I don't work very hard, but at least I try to work. Manual labor isn't for me, that's for sure. Thomas had overheard what Spencer was saying and told the engines the next day. He's very full of himself, said Henry. He doesn't understand the concept of hard work and effort, said Daisy. If he keeps at it, Sir Topham Hatt will send him away before he knows it, said Stanley. Now let's not speculate and spread rumors, said Edward. For the time being, Spencer is still on our railway, and we should give him the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps he's lonely. I'll go talk to him. When Edward arrived, however, Spencer was more than rude. Go away, he said snootily. You'll dirty up my paint. How? said Edward. I just came to say hello. Well, I know you don't mean it, he said. Just go away. I'm just trying to be friendly, said Edward. You know, other engines would like you more if you would just be nice to them. Who cares, said Spencer crossly. I won't be on Sodor for very much longer. The Duke mentioned something about sending me to another railway, a private railway, where engines are actually treated with respect and not forced to do dirty work in those things you call sightings. The island of Sodor is actually one of the nicest railways in the world, said Edward. Any engine with coal in his bunker would know that. You're no help, said Spencer. Maybe when the Duke returns, he'll stick you in his museum. After all, that's where you belong, isn't it? This made Edward very cross. I may be old, but I'm still useful. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go be productive and pull a train, because that's what real engines do. Spencer chuckled. It's only a matter of time before you get scrapped, Edward. You may as well cherish your last few days. Edward had finally had enough. He stormed away and was very cross the next few days. Finally, Sir Topham Hatt asked him what was wrong, and Edward told him. This is unacceptable, said Sir Topham Hatt. I was willing to give Spencer a chance to redeem himself, but he does nothing but complain and sit around all day. I will go give him one final warning. But Sir Topham Hatt didn't get the chance. As Gordon was taking some empty coaches from the yard to Knapford Station, Spencer rammed a cargo car into the coaches, knocking them off the line. My coaches, cried Gordon, you've damaged them. Oh, stop whining, said Spencer. You've damaged my cargo car. I'm going to go tell Sir Topham Hatt, and you're going to get in trouble. Sir Topham Hatt arrived a few moments later and inspected the crash. Well, this is obviously your fault, Spencer. You should have given Gordon the right-of-way because his train is on the main line. Just because Gordon's been on this railway longer doesn't mean he can do whatever he likes, shouted Spencer back. 
Just because the Duke and Duchess left you here doesn't mean you can make life miserable for the rest of us, shouted Gordon. Don't say that, said Spencer, and he banged the coaches hard again. Enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. Spencer, that is it. I will no longer tolerate this behavior on my railway. You've taken advantage of my gratuity for the past few years because you knew I wouldn't get rid of you while the Duke was here, but now that I am your owner, you will do as I say. Stop this at once! Just then, Molly came around the bend and swerved to avoid the pile up on the main line. She ran into a turntable wall, which stopped her from hitting some dangerous tankers. What are those doing there? asked Sir Topham Hatt. Those cars should never be near each other at all. It's dangerous. Arthur quickly awoke from his nap at the sheds. This has happened before, he said. Remember a few years ago when there was a similar incident at the brown turntable? Spencer put them here, sir, said Bill. I saw the whole thing happen. I thought he was going to move them eventually. That's why I didn't say anything. He wanted to cause a crash on purpose, said Douglas. Sir Topham Hatt, red in the face, turned to Spencer. That's it. You've sabotaged my railway. You helped the diesels take over my railway. And I will no longer tolerate your behavior on my railway. Fine, said Spencer. It's about time that I went to a proper railway. Goodbye, Sodor. And Spencer rushed away down the track. Come back here, said Sir Topham Hatt. But Spencer was gone. What now, sir? asked Bill. You can't get rid of Spencer if you can't find him. He'll show up in no time, said Sir Topham Hatt. Either that or he will run out of coal. Finally, the island of Sodor can have some peace and quiet. But unfortunately for Sir Topham Hatt, Spencer never did show up. The engines looked for him everywhere, but he was nowhere to be found. What if he fell off the track and rolled down a hill? asked Edward. Serves him right, said Henry. We've put up with his nonsense for long enough. It's time for him to go bug some other railway. I heard that he snuck out on one of those fishing boats, said Percy, but I don't know how true that is. Spencer, said Gordon, a sophisticated locomotive like himself on a fishing boat? Ugh, unlikely. Whatever the case may be, said Thomas, at least we can focus on our work now, knowing that Spencer is finally gone. And for the first time in many years, the engines went to sleep that night, knowing that they were just a little bit safer than they were before. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 161, Holly Jolly Molly. It was the Christmas season on the island of Sodor, but it certainly didn't feel like that. The engines had been overworked by the rush of holiday travelers and felt miserable. This isn't how the Christmas season is supposed to be, said Thomas cheerfully. We should be happy that we helped make Christmas special for the passengers. Oh, save it, Thomas, said James, and take that hat off, would you? Nobody is in the mood for your holiday cheer. That's right, said Percy. This has been a holiday season to forget. Cheer up, said Rosie. Everybody's attitude here is terrible. Let's have a great Christmas this year. Exactly, said Toby. Just because you've been busy doesn't mean a thing. Let's be happy that Sir Topham Hatt gave us Christmas Day off. Then it's back to work tomorrow morning, said Henry pessimistically. And the passengers are so ungrateful around this time of year, added Duck. Isn't it supposed to be the time of sharing and giving? Ugh, I certainly don't feel that. Thomas sighed. Never mind, he said. Nothing can fix your poor attitudes, not even Christmas cheer. Just then, Molly puffed up. She was in quite a hurry. What's going on? asked Rosie. Apparently, a ship has just been spotted off of the island, said Molly quickly. Sir Topham had is concerned about it, so I'm going to the docks to investigate. Percy gasped. You don't think this could be related to... You know who? We don't know, said Molly. I need to get to the docks as fast as I can. And she puffed away. The engines were in shock. Diesel has too many friends on different railways for my liking, said James. Every little thing that happens on this island is suddenly a big deal because we don't know if he and his minions are involved or not. Whoa, slow down, said Duck. It's just a ship. That doesn't mean that it automatically has to do with Diesel 10. Exactly, said Thomas. Let's not make a big fuss out of this. I'm going to go with Molly. I want to see what this is. Be careful, said Toby, and Thomas puffed away. When he arrived at the docks, Molly and Salty were already there. The ship was getting closer to shore, but they couldn't see who was aboard. We aren't expecting any ships because of Christmas, said Salty nervously. This can't be good, said Thomas. Sir Topham had arrived and looked out into the distance. It was nearing sunset and there was fog everywhere, so it was hard to tell what was on board. Sir, said Thomas, 
You don't suppose that? Of course not, Thomas, said Sir Topham Hatt. It's probably just a ship looking for a place to dock over the holidays. We must be kind and inviting. Finally, the ship broke through the fog and the engines could see a yellow engine aboard. The engine sighed with relief. Well, said Salty, at least it's not a troublesome engine like we were thinking it was. Who knows, said Molly. This engine could not want anything to do with the island. However, that was very much the opposite. Hello, said the engine. My name is Victor, and I'm on my way to a new railway. The ocean is very rough, and our boat is in danger of capsizing. Could we spend the night here, please? Sir Topham Hatt smiled. Of course you may, Victor. Welcome to the island of Sodor. Please, Cranky, put this engine on the rail so that he can go to a nice warm shed for the evening. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, said Victor, but I'm narrow gauge and I wouldn't be able to go anywhere on your rails. Then we must find a flatbed to take you to a shed, said Sir Topham Hatt. Thomas, would you please... Oh, no, sir, said Victor. I'm fine right on this boat, sir. Don't make any special accommodations for me. Hopefully the seas will calm down tomorrow and we can set off once again. Very well, said Sir Topham Hatt. I heard a storm is supposed to come to the island tonight, so stay safe. In the meantime, let's go home, everybody. It's freezing out here. Except you, Molly. I want to have a word with you. The engines puffed away, and soon Molly and Sir Topham Hatt were left alone. Molly, said Sir Topham Hatt, is it true that you spotted this ship from the coastline? Yes, sir, said Molly nervously. I I'm sorry, sir. I should have told you sooner, but I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Sir Topham Hatt laughed. Don't be sorry, Molly, he said. I'm very happy with what you've done here. A Christmas present for the island of Sodor. How wonderful is that? In such a time here on the island where we need all the cheer we can get. Thank you, Molly, for making this a very special Christmas indeed. The rest of the engines will be so pleased to see a visitor here at the docks. Molly smiled. Thank you, sir, she said. Now go have a Merry Christmas with the rest of your friends, said Sir Topham Hatt. Molly smiled and puffed away. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. That was a very nice conversation, said Victor. You must be very proud of your engines, sir. Oh, said Sir Topham Hatt, I didn't know you were listening. Yes, I am very proud of my engines. Sir Topham Hatt thought to himself for several seconds. Very proud indeed, he finally said. They are the most useful engines in the whole wide world. He turned to face Victor. Have a good night, Victor, and Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, uh... Oh, uh, my name is Sir Topham Hatt. Victor smiled. Thank you, sir. Sir Topham Hatt walked away. He had planned to spend Christmas with Lady Hatt and his family, but he knew there were other issues to be taken care of first. After a lengthy walk, he finally arrived at a shed just off the main line. There were no other engines around, and it was eerily silent. Well, said Sir Topham Hatt, so this is Diesel 10's gift to the Sodor Railway. I'm not a gift, said the engine. I'm here to tell you some important news, and I don't have a lot of time. I don't either, said Sir Topham Hatt, and since you've trespassed on my railway, I suggest you make it very quick. The engine cleared his throat and began to speak. Diesel 10 is up to no good. I don't know exactly what he's doing, but it's bad news for you and your railway. I just wanted to let you know. Sir Topham Hatt chuckled. Well, that's not new information to me. Diesel 10 is always up to no good. No, said the engine. This is different. Very different. He's got a lot more help this time around, even some engines that you may know of, and he's explicitly told us that he will not fail. He's determined to ruin your railway forever. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. Well, I've heard these types of threats before, but they're not very scary since Diesel 10 is too wimpy to come over here and say them to me himself. He has to send a messenger instead to do his dirty work. I'm not his messenger, said the engine. He doesn't know I'm here. I asked him if I could go get a new coat of paint, and he agreed, so I took the chance to hop across the border. You don't know how much trouble I could get into if I get caught. That's a decision you made when you agreed to meet with me, said Sir Topham Hatt. You're very lucky Molly spotted that new engine off the coast and distracted everybody while you were busy fumbling about on my railway. I believe it's time for you to go. Thank you for a good heating, but this railway can take care of itself. I don't need warnings from his followers. The engine sighed. Very well. I tried to warn you, Sir Topham Hatt, but if you won't take me seriously, then fine. 
I'll leave soon enough. Sir Topham Hatt turned away. Merry Christmas, and have a happy new year on the other railway, if that sort of thing is even possible. Just then, Molly appeared and puffed up next to Sir Topham Hatt. There you are, sir, she said. The engines and I are having a Christmas party at the sheds, and we were wondering if you wanted to join us. Uh, no thanks, said Sir Topham Hatt quickly. I'm spending Christmas with Lady Hatt, but thank you anyway. Oh, of course, sir. By the way, who are you talking to over there? You seem sort of angry. Sir Topham Hatt looked at the shed. Uh, nobody. Just talking to myself, that's all. Well, anyway, uh, Merry Christmas, Sir Topham Hatt. Can I give you a lift? Sir Topham Hatt smiled. Yes, of course. Thank you, Holly Jolly Molly, for your generous holiday spirit. What a wonderful Christmas this has turned out to be. Merry Christmas to all, Sir Topham Hatt shouted, and to all, good runnings on the Sodor Railway. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 162, Trembling Trevor. Christmas had come and gone on the island of Sodor, and Trevor the Traction Engine was feeling a bit down. I feel so lonely and cold during the winter time, he said sadly. I wish some engines would come visit me, like the old days. You're good company, Edward, but it would be nice to meet some new engines. Send one of those pesky twins over here for my enjoyment sometime, will you? What's their names? Uh, William and Benjamin? Edward laughed. You're close, he said, smiling. Bill and Ben, remember? Oh, of course, said Trevor. Bill and Ben. Wait, they're not the ones with the funny accents, are they? No, laughed Edward. That's Donald and Douglas. Bill and Ben are just flat out annoying in general. They don't need accents. Trevor sighed. So many new engines on Sodor, he said. I haven't even met all of them yet. It's a shame that nobody really comes back here. I get lonely, you know? This made Edward sad. I'll stay in touch, Trevor. And he puffed away. Edward thought a lot about Trevor that afternoon. What a good friend Trevor is, he said. Everybody's so preoccupied with their work and jobs that the new engines don't know who he is. That's what I'll do. I'll send Trevor an engine he's never met before, and hopefully they can become best friends. Edward was going to ask the other engines what they thought about the idea, but when he rolled into the docks, he could tell that something was amiss. What's going on? He asked Boko. Shh, said Boko. Listen. Diesel, Airy, and Bert were talking to Sir Topham Hatt. And he hasn't been seen since, said Diesel crossly. We've done all we can do. Now we need your help, Sir Topham Hatt. Yeah, said Airy. It's about time you cared about your diesel engines, too. I do care, said Sir Topham Hatt, but I've had other things on my mind recently as well. Where did you last see Norman? The last anybody saw of him was Whiff, said Diesel. That's why we called him here. Sir Topham Hatt turned his attention to Whiff. Is this true? Yes, sir, said Whiff. It was back when Paxton left for the big city, sir. There were lots of rumors going around that day, and Norman thought Paxton had been sent away. After I told him what was going on, he said he was going to go find Paxton, and well... And that's the last anybody saw of him, said Bert crossly. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. Are you sure that's the last time you saw him? Paxton's trip to the big city happened many, many months ago. It was during the summer. Exactly, said Diesel crossly. It's been many, many months, and it's just come to your attention, Sir Topham Hatt. Had this been Thomas, you would have been worried sick the next day. But since Norman's a Diesel, I guess you can just forget the fact that he's been missing for months. That's enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. This was not brought to my attention until today. Boko, please go with Diesel and search all over the island. I'm afraid if Norman's been gone this long and he hasn't shown up, the chances of finding him are going to be slim. But it's worth a shot. Yes, sir, said Boko. Let me go refuel first. Edward could not believe what he had heard. Norman's gone? he asked curiously. It appears so, said Sir Topham Hatt, but I'm sure he'll turn up somewhere. He wasn't on the island for very long. I wonder what caused him to disappear. Edward sighed. I wish I could help, he said sadly. But we must move on to other things, said Sir Topham Hatt. You came to see me, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir, said Edward, and he explained to Sir Topham Hatt what had been going on with Trevor. Trevor has to be lonely sitting in that field all day, said Sir Topham Hatt, but I like your idea. In fact, a new engine arrived a few days ago for a short visit. 
"'You mean Victor, sir?' asked Edward. "'No, another engine, in fact,' said Sir Topham Hatt. "'Unlike Victor, this engine was expected. "'I'll let this engine know that Trevor is looking for a new friend.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Edward. "'Trevor will be delighted.' "'And indeed, he was excited.' "'Oh, boy,' said Trevor. "'A new engine I have never met before. "'Hopefully he's a smart engine, "'and we can have some nice conversations.' "'I've never met him before,' said Edward, "'but from what Sir Topham had has told me, "'he seems like that type of engine. "'But don't waste your time, Trevor. "'He's only here for a short visit, "'so make every chance you spend with him important.' "'Will do,' said Trevor. "'I wonder when he'll stop by.' That night, Trevor rolled up next to the track and decided to rest. It was a foggy, moonlit night, and it was just a little bit spooky out. Nothing scares me, said Trevor. I've seen it all. I was almost scrapped, for goodness sakes. If I can survive that, I think I can handle some fog. Just then, Trevor heard an engine coming down the track. This might be the new engine, he said. But if it is, I wish Edward would have warned me beforehand. The engine stopped and let out a big sigh. Ah, this is a nice island indeed. I could really get used to this place. Hello, said Trevor suddenly. Nice to meet you, Mr. New Engine. I'm Trevor, and the engine hissed loudly and rushed away very quickly. Wait, where are you going? asked Trevor. Mr. New Engine, I'm right here. It's me, Trevor. But Trevor was all alone. Now that was a bit scary, he admitted. I don't like that new engine. He was rather rude and didn't even say hi back. Ugh, I thought Edward would have been a lot wiser in choosing a friend to come visit me. The next morning, Trevor felt much better but was still confused. Edward arrived to say hello. How was your visit last night with the new engine, he asked. What's his name? I don't know, said Trevor. Your friend wasn't very social. What do you mean? asked Edward. He stopped, said a couple of nonsensical words, and then rushed away when I tried to speak to him. So much for a new best friend. Edward was confused. I'm sorry he wasn't nice, said Edward. I'm going to go tell Sir Topham Hatt about that. Edward arrived at the docks where Sir Topham Hatt was listening to Diesel and Boko again. No sign at all, said Diesel gravely. It's like he vanished in the thin air, agreed Boko. Keep checking, said Sir Topham Hatt. Ah, Edward, and so nice to see you. Have you met Gator before? Edward looked over at the new engine. Oh, so you're the visitor, he said. Well, for one thing, you treated my friend Trevor very poorly last night. I beg your pardon, said Gator, but I've never met an engine called Trevor. He's a traction engine, said Edward impatiently, and you were quite rude to him. Gator smiled. I think you're confused, my good friend Edward. I didn't go anywhere last night or see any traction engines at all. I was here at the docks like I usually am. Edward felt very silly. Oh, my apologies, Gator. Apparently, I have you confused with some other engine. Indeed, said Sir Topham Hatt. I haven't even had the chance to tell Gator about Trevor because I've been so busy. So another engine must have spooked Trevor last night. This made Edward very concerned. He rushed back to Trevor's field and told him what had happened. Well then, who was it? asked Trevor. He scared the living daylights out of me. I don't know, said Edward, but I have a hunch it wasn't somebody from the Sodor Railway. What? cried Trevor. Edward, you can't be saying that. Trevor, you didn't recognize the engine, did you? Trevor sighed. No, I didn't. And you haven't met Gator yet, said Edward, and any Sodor engine would have been nice to you, I'm sure. Something strange is happening. Spencer running away, Norman disappearing all of a sudden. Whoever that engine was that visited you last night, I'm pretty sure they didn't want to get caught here on the island. That's why they ran away so fast when they realized you were here. Trevor took a deep breath. Should we tell Sir Topham Hat? No, said Edward. He's too busy right now to worry about silly things like this. In the meantime, don't say anything to anybody, not even Gator when he comes to visit. I'll see if I can learn anything else. Trevor was very confused, and he felt as though he didn't understand the entire story. But eventually, Gator came to visit, and all was well. Edward was still concerned about what had happened, however. There are visitors on the Sodor Railway that Sir Topham Hatt doesn't know about, he said to himself. I know I should tell him, but it will only make things worse. And a wild goose chase after an engine I don't even know the looks of will not help. Still, I'll keep an eye out, that's for sure. If that engine returns again, he won't get away so easily this time. 
Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 163, Old Square Wheels. Why is everybody leaving? cried Henry one morning. Shh, be quiet, Henry, said Neville. I'm trying to sleep. It just isn't fair, he continued. First the Duke and Duchess leave, then Spencer disappears, and all this time Norman's been missing, and now Mike and Frank are leaving for the Arsdale Railway. They're not leaving, said Fergus wearily. They're going to visit their friends on the Arlesdale Railway for a short time. They'll be back, just like the Duke and Duchess. Still, said Henry, everything's changing and I don't like it. Oh, get with the times, Henry, said Dennis. Nothing stays the same forever. Of course, I don't blame you for not understanding that concept. You are, after all, a steam engine trying to survive in a modern world. Soon you'll understand what survival of the fittest is really all about. What are you mumbling about? asked Neville impatiently. We're trying to sleep. Don't get so dramatic all of a sudden. It's true, though, continued Dennis. It will only be a matter of time before this railway is completely run by diesels, and you steam engines will be... That's enough of that, said Fergus impatiently. Stop interrupting me, said Dennis crossly. How about you stop trying to scare us, said Neville. I know you're upset that Norman's gone, but... Dennis grew crosser still. Norman's not gone. He's missing. There's a difference, mind you. And your wonderful controller, Sir Topham Hatt, doesn't care one bit because he's not a steam engine. Sir Topham Hatt does care, said Neville. He's, he's just busy, that's all. He sent Diesel and Boko searching all around the island and they couldn't find him. What more do you want? That's enough, Dennis, said Diesel as he rolled up. No sense in arguing with these irrelevant types. Let's go. Dennis was furious. This is only the beginning, he said. You better watch your back, old square wheels. And he rolled away. Irrelevant. Huh, said Fergus. How dare he? Henry felt sad. Old square wheels, he muttered bitterly and left the turntable. He continued on for a long time until he came to the airport where Jeremy was. Henry stopped on the tracks. Everything's changing. What happened to the good old days of Sodor, when there were just a few of us and we all knew what was going on? It really is quite embarrassing that nobody noticed Norman was missing for several months. You know, this wouldn't have happened if... Oh, excuse me, said an engine, but I need to get through. Oh, I beg your pardon, said Henry. Let me get out of your way. Henry felt so embarrassed that he rushed away without saying goodbye. Oh, silly me, he said as he rolled into a siding, stopping on the main line thinking that nobody would come. I really might be losing it after all. That afternoon, Henry had to take some logs from Ellsbridge Station to Maithwaite. The engine Henry had seen that morning was waiting for him. Sorry about earlier today, said Henry. I don't know what I was doing. No worry, said the engine. I'm Gator, by the way. I'm visiting the island for a short time. Nice to meet you, said Henry. Have you met any other engines so far? Most of them, said Gator. I'm actually very good friends with Trevor the Traction Engine. I stop by his field every day and we talk about a variety of topics. Trevor is a nice fellow, said Henry. And if you have the chance, say goodbye to Mike and Frank, if you've met them already. They're leaving to go take a visit back to their old railway. I don't know them, said Gator curiously, but I wish them all the best. They're taking a vacation, just like me. Suddenly, Henry realized something. You're right, Gator, he said. Mike and Frank are just like you. Yes, said Gator. Yes, they are. Well, I think they are. Actually, I, I don't really know, to be quite honest. No, you don't understand. I've been sad all day because so many things are changing on the island of Sodor, but you've just made it very clear to me that everything will turn out right in the end. Of course it will, said Gator. Things always seem to work out that way. Now, let's see. What were you so sad about? Ugh, a variety of topics, said Henry. One of them was the fact that there's so many new engines on Sodor all the time. Don't get me wrong, I like visitors, but there's no sense of community, and I feel as though we as a railway aren't very strong. It's quite concerning, considering there have been some strange happenings lately. Gator nodded. Yes, Trevor told me what happened a few nights ago. Quite scary, really. But don't you worry, Henry. Don't let the diesels call you old square wheels because you're not. You may be an older engine, but you certainly know a lot more than those youngins do. Henry felt much better. Thank you, Gator. I actually feel very good right now. Do you want to go have some fun? 
Why not, agreed Gator. Henry and Gator left the station and their trains behind. They were both very happy that everything was much better than it was before. Each of them found a truck and pushed them near the airport junction. This is quite silly, said Gator, but who cares? It's time we had some fun. Don't you agree, Henry? Henry chuckled. Oh, absolutely. I feel like a silly little tank engine messing around in the yard. This is going to be fun. Henry backed up and bumped his tanker hard. It rolled down the line and became derailed at a switch. Oh no, cried Henry. I didn't mean for that to happen. We must go get the breakdown train and fix that immediately. No worries, Henry, said Gator. We have some time. The odds of an engine coming along and striking that tanker right now are second to none. Just then, Gordon rounded the bend and smashed into the tanker head on, sending tar flying down the track and covering the ground. Apparently, said Gator, the odds are not in our favor. What is this? cried Gordon. Henry, Gator, did you cause this? Sorry, Gordon, said Henry. Gator and I were just trying to have some fun. Have fun? On the main line? Are you crazy? Good thing I wasn't pulling the express, or else. That brings up a good question, though, said Henry. Gordon, why aren't you pulling the express? Oh, I, um... Well, I decided to let James pull it today. You know, he had been bugging me so much lately that I just finally gave in. Henry was skeptical, but didn't have time to wonder. He and Gator tried to clean up the mess, but James arrived with Sir Topham Hat on board. Henry, Gator, he asked, why is there tar everywhere? It's, it's my fault, sir, said Gator. I convinced Henry to... No, 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 said Henry. It's my fault, sir. I've been quite sad lately because a lot of things are changing. The Duke and Duchess and Spencer and Norman all left, and now Mike and Frank are going to be gone for a long time. I miss the old days of Sodor, sir. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. Henry, I understand. A lot of things have happened recently, but that doesn't mean you have to be sad. For example, even though we lost Spencer and Norman, we have Gator and Victor to make you feel happy and cheerful. Henry smiled. That is true, sir, he said. Oh, I'm sorry for acting so silly. As long as you've learned your lesson, said Sir Topham Hatt. But the problem now is this tar is getting sticky, and it will ruin the tracks unless it's cleaned up properly. Ugh, oh, I will have to get a repair crew out here soon. Now, I believe both of you have trains to pull, am I correct? Yes, sir, said the engines, and they rushed away. Well then, said Sir Topham Hatt, it appears... Oh, hello, Gordon. I almost didn't see you there. Any reason why you didn't pull the express today and decided to let James take it? Uh, no, sir, said Gordon. I... I just wasn't really feeling up for it today. Uh, goodbye, and Gordon puffed away. What was that about? asked James. I mean, I'm very happy to be taking the express, but that was just strange. Indeed, said Sir Topham Hatt. Henry's right about one thing, though. Things are changing, but hopefully everything will turn out for good. Gator seems to have made a positive influence on him, but it will only be a matter of time before Diesel and his friends start making all of the engines question their relevance. Anyway, carry on, James. Sir Topham Hatt hopped aboard and James sped away. Things may have been changing on Sodor, but nobody was going to call Henry old square wheels from now on. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 164, Wooden Brakes. Wake up, you silly engines, said Bertram one morning. It's time to get your day started. No, said Smudger wearily. I'm tired. Why can't I sleep in one day during the week without you waking me up so early? Because, said Bertram, you're supposed to be at Boulder Mountain in ten minutes, and Thumper is not going to be pleased if you're late. Smudger gasped. Ten minutes? Oh, I better hurry. Thanks, Bertram. Reneus smiled. Bertram has been such a good influence on our railway. And, added Scarloe, it's nice to have another set of wheels around so we're not quite as busy. Just then, Mighty Mac rolled out of the shed. I'm glad you two are awake, said Bertram. You have an important appointment, remember? Yeah, yeah, said Mighty. No need to remind me. Why aren't you excited, exclaimed Mac. We're going to the works to finally get rid of these old wooden brakes of ours. Now we can be like modern engines. 
Rusty was confused. You still have wooden brakes? Yes, said Mac. We should have gotten them changed a long time ago, but somebody has a hard time with new parts. It's not my fault, said Mighty defensively. I just don't take nicely to new things. Plus, what's so wrong with wooden brakes anyway? They're dangerous, said Freddy. They can catch on fire, said Sir Handel. And, said Duke, you look flat out silly with them. The engines laughed. If Duke's insulting you, said Rusty, I think it's time that you got those changed. Don't worry, Mighty, you'll be fine. We'll see about that nonsense, said Mighty. He wasn't so convinced yet. Let's go, said Mac. I don't want to be late for our appointment. And the two left the other engines behind. Thank you for organizing that appointment, Bertram, said Rusty graciously. Mac has been dying to get new brakes for ages, but Mighty still needed some assistance. No problem at all, said Bertram. That's the last appointment I have for all the narrow gauge engines. So once Mighty Mac gets back, you will all be up to professional railway standards. Not only is it safer, but you also must feel better, right? The engines murmured in agreement. However, Mighty was still unconvinced. I don't need new brakes, he said. These ones work just fine, see? And Mighty applied his brakes hard, bringing Mac to a halt. Stop it, he said. You're going to break your brakes before you get new brakes. How silly of you. Just then, Mighty thought of a good idea. That's it, he said, and the two continued on to the works. That evening, the engines were telling stories when Mighty Mac returned. Look at my new brakes, said Mac, and he screeched to a stop with ease. Wow, said Sir Handel, how fancy. Let's see your new brakes too, Mighty, said Bertram eagerly. Uh, no thanks, said Mighty. It's been a long day with a lot of traveling, and I need some rest. Good night, everyone, and Mighty shoved Mac into the shed. Oh, don't worry, said Bertram confidently to the other engines. I'm sure Mighty will get used to his new brakes. But Mighty hadn't gotten new brakes at the works, and Mac had been too distracted by his new ones that he didn't notice. Joke's on them, said Mighty cheekily, and he fell asleep. The next morning, Mighty Mac left to go work at the incline where Smudger was waiting. Aren't you supposed to be at Boulder Mountain? asked Mighty when he arrived. Yeah, we're all supposed to do a lot of things, said Smudger. The work there is so boring anyways. Plus, I heard a rumor that Boulder is in danger of falling off the mountain again, so I told Thumper I'd be sick for the next few days. Brilliant plan, said Mighty. I did the same thing at the works yesterday and didn't get new brakes like I was supposed to. What do you think of that? Smudger, however, was not impressed. That's a safety issue, he said, and it's a little bit different than me skipping work. If those old wooden things split, you're in a heap of trouble. You remember James' story about his crash many years ago, right? James probably made that up to scare little engines like you, said Mighty. I'm not scared, and these old things haven't let me down so far, so there's no harm, really. Ahem, said Mac, but I've been here the entire time, and I've heard enough. Mighty, you need new brakes. In fact, I won't work with you until I personally see the workmen put those new parts on you. Hooray, said Mighty. No work for the foreseeable future. Stop it, said Mac, and I mean it. Look, here comes the manager. I'm going to tell him everything. The incline winch is stuck again, and I need an engine to go up to the top to see what's the matter, preferably one who has good brakes, in case you need to stop quickly. Oh, that's an easy choice, said Mighty. We just went to the works yesterday, Mr. Manager. Here we go. Before Matt could respond, Mighty shot up the incline and stopped at the top. You sly thing, said Mac. You're going to get us into trouble. It's not like Smudger was going to do the job anyway, said Mighty. Well, here's the problem. One of the slate cars has become derailed and it's holding up the rest of the line. This is an easy fix. Just then, Mighty noticed something below. Look, he said, it's Gordon, on his way to pull the express, perhaps. But instead of following the line to the left, Gordon kept going straight and disappeared. Hmm, said Mighty, I've never seen an engine use that track before. I didn't even know there was a line back there. 
Stop babbling to yourself, said Mac. We need to get down before something bad happens. Nothing bad is going to happen. Now stop complaining, please. You're making me nervous. Mac had had enough. He started to move towards the hill in hopes of getting down, but Mighty countered by moving forward himself. Soon the two engines were locked in a tight battle, back and forth. Stop it, said Mac. You're going to make us crash. I have better wheels than you, said Mighty cheerfully. They oiled them up at the works yesterday since I didn't get new brakes. I think we know who's going to win this. Fine, said Mac. You win. And Mac stopped moving, but Mighty still was. The engines smashed into the slate cars and they fell off the incline. What was that for? exclaimed Mighty. Whoops, said Mac. Sorry. I'll show you, said Mighty, and he pushed Mac and himself down the incline. Both engines tried to stop, but they fell off the track into a ditch. You fool, shouted Mac. If you had gotten new brakes like you were supposed to, we would have been able to stop in time. Mighty sighed and realized that Mac was right. Suddenly, he sniffed the air. Do you smell something burning, he asked Mac. Sort of. Wait, Mighty, it's your brakes! They've caught on fire! The two engines began to freak out, but there was nothing they could do because they weren't on the rails. Luckily, the flames didn't spread and the fire department put it out with ease. Still, the engines felt silly and Mighty's brakes were nothing but ash. How could this happen? asked Bertram. You two just received new brakes yesterday. I did, said Max snootily, but my friend Mighty here didn't. Mighty felt very silly. I should have listened to both of you, Mac and Bertram. I now realize the importance of modern parts, and I won't fight it any more. Sir Topham had arrived and looked at the engines. I'm glad you've learned your lesson, Mighty, he said. Gordon found the damaged slate cars by the track on the main line, so I will need to get more of those so that work can continue. Suddenly, Mighty remembered what he had seen. Sir, he said, what was Gordon doing on the main line if he wasn't pulling in the express. Well, I don't know exactly, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'm sure he was on his way to pull another train. That's all. No, said Mighty. I saw him. He didn't follow the main line, sir. He went onto another track and, uh, what are you talking about, laughed Sir Topham Hatt. I think you must have hit your head on the way down. Get some rest, Mighty, and tomorrow you are both going to the works again, this time for proper repairs. Mighty sighed. He realized it would be futile to try and argue with Sir Topham Hatt about Gordon. That evening, Sir Topham Hatt was inspecting the damaged slate cars when Gordon arrived. I did exactly what you told me to do, sir, said Gordon. Hopefully nobody saw me. I tried to be as sneaky as possible. Mighty Mac was messing around on the incline, said Sir Topham Hatt, and they managed to see you. However, they don't have any idea what you were doing. Phew, said Gordon. That was a close call. Now let's head home before anybody else sees us. Sir Topham Hatt climbed aboard and Gordon rolled silently away. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 165, Boko and the Coco. So you're visiting too? What a coincidence, so am I. Yes, said Victor, but not for much longer. I think I've outstayed my welcome by a few weeks. Don't worry, said Gator. It's not your fault that the seas are still rough. The weather has been terrible so far this year, and your ship is in bad shape. Yeah, said Bullstroke, and I'm sure Sir Topham Hatt doesn't mind you staying here a while. Victor sighed with relief. I'm very grateful to have gotten a chance to see the island of Sodor. Many engines talk about it as if it's a magical tale, not really sure if it exists or not. We exist all right, said Cranky, although I'm not really sure about the magic part. Just then, Boko arrived at the docks. Making new friends, are we, Gator? Oh, yes. An engine can never have too many friends. Boko backed up and was coupled to a train. What's that for? asked Victor. It's a train full of cocoa, and I'm taking it to the airport where Jeremy is going to fly some to the mainland overnight. I'd best be going now. You all better stay out of trouble while I'm gone. 
The engines chuckled and Boko pulled the train away. He was making good time when he was forced to stop at a signal outside of Ellsbridge Station. What's the meaning of this? asked Boko. This is an important train and it needs to get to the airport as soon as possible. Look, it's practically right there. He honked his horn impatiently. I don't have time for this, he grumbled crossly. The signalman stepped outside. Sorry, Boko, he said, but I received a report that another train is coming through soon, and I was told to divert all engines in the way. How rude, muttered Boko. This better not take long. Just then an engine flew past the signal and was gone. Who was that, cried Boko. That engine didn't look familiar at all. I don't know, said the signalman. I'm just doing my job. Wait a moment, said Boko. Are you sure that maybe I'm the important train and you're supposed to stop engines like that instead of me? Oh, said the signalman. You're probably right. Boko sighed and reversed. I have a feeling that engine doesn't belong on Sodor, he said, and I'm going to make sure. Boko pulled the train hard and tried to catch up. He flew under Toby's windmill, but suddenly derailed and crashed off the track without any warning. Boko was furious, and the engine had escaped. Of course, said Boko crossly. Just perfect. Sir Topham Hatt is never going to believe this. The cleanup crew arrived and Sir Topham Hatt was there as well. This isn't your fault, Boko, he said. These tracks here are covered in some old tar. An incident with Gator, Henry, and Gordon from a few weeks ago. I forgot to have it cleaned up and this is the result. Boko was surprised. Usually Sir Topham Hatt doesn't forget such big things as this, he said to himself. That's very unlike him. He must be very busy if he forgot something as important as this. Fortunately, the Coco was not damaged and Harvey delivered the cars to the airport. Still, Boko was cross and not having finished the job. So sorry for the problems today, Boko, said Sir Topham Hatt. I've been busy lately, to say the least. This is all my fault. No worries, sir, said Boko. I'm just glad it wasn't another engine, like Gordon. Gordon, said Sir Topham Hatt. What do you know about Gordon? Who told you about that? Uh, nobody, sir, said Boko. I was just saying that, uh, it was better that I crashed instead of an engine like Gordon because, uh, well, Gordon could have been pulling an important train like the Express or something like that. Fortunately, I was just pulling some Coco cars that are easily replaceable, but in Gordon's case, passengers are not. Sir Topham Hatt sighed. Oh, yes, that's what you meant. I was thinking of something else. Sir, said Boko, are you feeling... I need to go now, said Sir Topham Hatt. This part of the line has been ruined by the tar, and I will need to get it replaced. I must go work on that. And Sir Topham Hatt walked away. Boko was very confused. What is wrong with Sir Topham Hatt, he wondered. As soon as Boko was put on the track, he went straight to the yard where his friends were and explained what he had seen. Sir Topham Hatt was acting very unusual, he said, as if he couldn't concentrate. I've never seen him like that before, ever. That's scary, said Thomas. Sir Topham Hatt is always so focused when it comes to railway matters. And to forget something as big as a tar spill, said Oliver. Now that's strange. He's probably just stressed out, said Stepney. I sure hope he's feeling all right. Gordon, who hadn't said anything so far, spoke up. I need to go now. I, uh, I have a train to pull. Wait, said Boko. Sir Topham had said something about you too, Gordon. Oh, I'm sure he didn't, said Gordon. Now please, let me through. It was as if he thought you were nearby or something continued Boko, and he started to panic when I said your name. Gordon bumped Boko hard. I need to go now, he said quickly. Excuse me, please. Boko quietly backed up and Gordon rushed away. What was that about? asked Stepney. Gordon apparently didn't want to talk about things, said Thomas. Does any of this strike you as strange? asked Boko. Spencer leaving, Norman's disappearance, Gator and Victor arriving. Now Gordon and Sir Topham Hatt know something we don't. Whoa, how do you know that? asked Oliver. Gordon's just late for his train, that's all. Gordon hasn't been pulling the express, said Boko. James has been taking it almost every day for some reason. And I'm sure Gordon isn't pulling it because he would need to head to Natford Station to take his train, not the opposite direction. The engine sat in silence. 
Well, maybe you're right, said Thomas finally, but we shouldn't spread rumors about this. Sir Topham Hatt is our controller and knows what's going on, and Gordon is a well-respected engine who might be taking a break. Thomas's voice trailed off. You're right, Boko, said Oliver. This is strange. Way too strange just to be a coincidence. And not to mention, said Boko, but... I saw an unfamiliar engine today right before my crash, but I didn't say anything since Sir Top of Hat doesn't need more trouble. The engines gasped and continued to talk about Boko's strange engine. Meanwhile, Gordon was not on his way to pull the express as Boko had predicted. He arrived at Tidmouth Station later that evening to collect a train. A few hours later, Gordon finally arrived on the other side of the island. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting for him. About time you arrived, Gordon, said Sir Topham Hatt jokingly. It's nearly midnight. Sorry, sir, said Gordon, but I had to be careful that nobody saw me while I was traveling. I understand, said Sir Topham Hatt. I would rather have you be careful than get caught. You don't know how much trouble I had to go through in order to get away from the sheds, said Gordon. The engines thought I was going crazy or something. Soon they will know said Sir Topham Hatt. You're my trusted confidant, Gordon, and I appreciate your secrecy. You will be compensated for your trouble. And I'm tired of letting James take the express, said Gordon sadly. You don't know how much it hurts to watch him pull it every day. Don't worry, this will all be over soon. For now, however, we can't tell them anything, because I'm sure it will somehow get to the diesels, and then we'll have a huge mess on our hands. Sir Topham had inspected the equipment. Rather old, he said, and quite dusty. It's been sitting in that old shed near Tidmouth since it arrived, said Gordon. The engine stared back at Sir Topham Hatt. Safety goggles and everything. At least he came prepared. The engine smiled happily. But he's not much of a talker, said Gordon. I tried to have a conversation with him and he wouldn't say a word. He's probably shy, that's all. Well, Sodor Railway Repair, are you ready to get to work in a few days? The Sodor Railway Repair nodded. Fantastic, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'll come by to check on you tomorrow. Removing tar from railroad track is difficult, so you have a long project ahead of you. And as for you, Gordon, you won't have to keep making strange visits for me anymore. Soon all of the engines will know about this, and not a day too soon. Yes, sir, said Gordon. I can't wait to get back to being a really useful engine. Sir Topham Hatt climbed aboard and Gordon puffed away. An engine rolled out of the shadows and stopped. Well played, Sir Topham Hatt, well played. But Diesel 10 will know about this, as he does about everything, because the claw is the law, and his time is now. And the engine rolled silently away into the shadows.